you to make our phone calls in rotation. Okay. We'll see what we can do. That reminds me of another street light question. Are the, are the new lights on Carroll Avenue working? Because they were not working. I don't believe they are, Councilmember Williams. I know we have been in contact with PEPCO, as has I know Councilmember Austin Lane has also made some outreach efforts. Uh, we'll follow up with uh, Mr. Daly sometime this week and see what the status of that is. Yeah, because I, I noticed when the, uh, what I assume are the new decorations went up that included lights that plug into the lights and gee, they're there, but nothing's happening. Anything else? Uh, just to keep the council apprised, we um, uh, I, I announced last week that Jamie Raskin is having a health care forum at uh, Montgomery College, and the date has been changed from December 1st, this Friday, to December 15th, two weeks from this Friday. And it's still at 12 noon in the Health Sciences Building on the first floor. Um, what else do I want to... Uh, also, uh, it, it does... Um, I did get confirmation that Mrs. Hevia has now moved into the um, the new home, 7133 Carroll, and uh, she's very um, pleased with everything, and uh, all the um, documents that were needed have been forthcoming, and I'm, I'm very pleased at what the council and the city, the community, historic Tacoma, um, what we have all accomplished in, in, uh, in this first step towards rebuilding the fire station, and I thank you all for the, the many years that you have um, labored <laughs> over this project. And I think we have some folks here from Historic Tacoma who also spent some time working on that issue and want to thank them also. Anyone else? All right. Um, we have in front of us um, one set of minutes from October 23rd. Move adoption. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Minutes for October 23rd are adopted. Um, the next item is the public comment period. Um, we will have a time um, just following the city manager's update when we um, do a resolution recognizing Mark Elrich. So if you have comments on that, I'd ask if you'd hold those comments until we get to that point. But if you have comments on anything that is not on our regular meeting agenda or any other uh, topic that you'd like to bring before the council, this would be the appropriate time to do so. Are there any public comments? All right, seeing none, um, we will move we will move to the city manager's update. <laughs> yeah, just two brief items this evening. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that the ANCL architects will be making a presentation to the city council um, a week from tonight on the gym feasibility study. Uh, unrelated to the community center, I did want to mention to the council that I had sent a letter uh, last week to Royce Hansen, chair of the planning board, concerning um, the city's funding request for FY08. Um, staff is also working on some correspondence to other applicable county agencies regarding our funding request to further advance the council's goals. Um, so as always, we'll make sure that you get copied on that correspondence. Okay. Uh, that concludes my report, unless there's questions about any particular items. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to the first item on our regular meeting agenda, which is a resolution uh, recognizing Mark Elrich, and I'd like to move this myself. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. It's before the council. Um, I was trying to remember when the first time I met Mark was, exactly before he even got on the council, because I'm sure Mark doesn't remember this, but it was in the late 80s, I think, and I was interested in... Um, I forget whether it was Silver Spring development, traffic, or something like that, and went to this big public meeting or public hearing or something. And um, I remember very vividly, Mark was both the loudest and the most knowledgeable person in the room. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I was going to say that I think as he's gotten more experience, Mark has learned to sort of downplay the loud and while keeping the knowledgeable. Um, and he certainly deserves a lot of credit for winning a very competitive race for the county council. Um, the, the other thing that I've always admired about Mark is he's very committed to um, the well-being of the least privileged members of our community. 
and that's always been a very clear priority of his and one that he invariably follows. Um, and he brings his, um, his wealth of knowledge and commitment um, to help the folks that really need his help. Um, and I, I, very, I have always admired that and we um, look forward to continuing to work with you on the County Council and continuing to um, work for the betterment of the people who need our help the most. And to follow up on your comment, Mayor Porter, about Mark watching out for those in the community who are sometimes the least advantaged in many ways, something else that ties into that that I think is very important is the, the growth that Mark has shown in also being able to work with and understand some of the needs of, let's say, uh, business owners or uh, other interests that maybe have a little more uh, advantage in working the system and in forging compromise with all the members of the community to try and come up with a win-win situation. And I've seen that growth in the time that I've known Mark, and it's a, pr a pretty special ability to watch out for those who are least advantaged while also working with other members of the community to try and get something for everybody. Um, I was thinking about when I first met Mark, and I think it was uh, when I was, uh, when there was a forum, oh, in the early 90s, and it was about, uh, it, it resulted in the Task Force on Family Diversity. And I remember that Mark and my predecessor on the council, Hank Prinsky, who's in the audience, were the two members of the council who were immediately very supportive of uh, many of the issues that came up in that forum and uh, pushed for the city to uh, do a number of things, including uh, the efforts that resulted in uh, domestic partnership benefits, where the city was uh, one of the leaders in the, in the country in doing that. Um, I also really value Mark as, a, as the institutional memory for this body. You've, you've now finished 19 years on the city council. And uh, I, I know that uh, one of the advantages of uh, winning the county council seat and not doing a 20th year on the council is that you will not have to be inducted into the Municipal Officials <laughs> Hall of Fame of <laughs> Maryland Municipal <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and, and I know that uh, that's something that uh, you appreciate not having to do. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, yeah, but I, I kind of thought maybe you'd think of that as the old farts club. <laughs> and you didn't want to go there. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate uh, having known you all this time and, and being able to work with you and seeing the great things that you've done and knowing that the residents of Montgomery County, the residents of the region, the residents of the state are going to have a, an increased and renewed appreciation for those abilities that you're going to bring to the County Council. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Porter. Uh, well, first, Mark, congratulations on your uh, successful campaign. As Mayor Porter pointed out, it was a hard-fought race and you did an excellent job. And uh, I guess uh, the many years of experience you had <laughs> running campaigns at the county level uh, uh, helped. But uh, I think the the vote that we saw in both in the primary and, and the general election uh, showed the level high level of support we're getting from the county residents. Um, you know, when I think back of my uh, time here on the City Council, I really appreciate the help that you gave me as I uh, struggled to grow into being a council member. Uh, you, uh, you supported me uh, sometimes even when I think you didn't agree with me, and you helped me uh, to temper some of my opinions and see the other side, which I found to be very helpful. I've always... Uh, always appreciated and, and uh, been impressed with your creativity in, in addressing the issues 
that come before this council, and uh, I think that's going to serve the county residents well if you move on to the county council. I'm, in a way, a little sorry to see you go because uh, I feel you're uh, a friend here on the council and a, and a friend in our community, and I know that your being on the county council uh, may lead you to believe you're going to see me less, uh, but since you are at the county level and since I have interests uh, that I think um, uh, go down some of the similar paths to yours, uh, I'm hopeful that I'm going to be seeing you much more. Congratulations. Um, I think that I'm actually glad that you're going on to the council, to the county council, not because I want you to leave the city council, but because I think it would be really good for the county. Um, I think I've said that to you before. I, I think that you know, with, with all of the perspective that you have on what it, what it means to be a city in the state of Maryland and how important that is to the folks here in Tacoma Park and across to in, in cities that are across the county, I think that that's going to be really helpful. And I think it's going to be a good thing for all of us in Tacoma Park and all of the people in, in the county. So, you know, while I think like the others, I'll be sad to, to, to see you go from a, from a friendship perspective and from the, from the perspective of having somebody to bounce ideas off of and to, to argue endlessly with. Um, I'm really happy for the county, and I, I think it, it's to all of our benefit. So I think that, that for me, I think that, that that really outweighs any sadness that I feel about you going, because I'm, I'm just I'm really excited for the, for the potential there. And I wish, I wish you the best. Thank you. First met Mark uh, several years ago when I was thinking about running for the city council, and everyone said, you've got to go and talk to Mark. And I don't think I'd met him before, maybe just once in passing. Went over to his house and was welcomed in. He poured me a cup of coffee. And it was a little bit like a scene from uh, The Graduate. <laughs> no, he wasn't Mrs. Robinson. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you may remember that scene when uh, uh, I think it was Mrs. Robinson's husband that was talking to the Dustin Hoffman character and said, you've got to really invest in plastics. And so uh, Mark had this sort of impish grin on his face, and he pulled out a postcard. And he said, this is what you've got to do. And the postcard was from his previous uh, attempt at running for the council. And he said, this really worked. <laughs> he talked to me about how you constructed it what you say in it. And I tried it, and it was quite successful. <laughs> so I have to <laughs> thank him for that. Uh, but there was so much more. Um, you know, I, I try to think back on what I can learn from all of my colleagues here uh, in the three years that I've been on the council. And in, in Mark's case, it's pretty pretty easy uh, to, to generalize uh, the lessons that, that I have learned from Mark. One, of course, is his encyclopedic knowledge of, of issues. And when he was running for the council, I remember one night I uh, went to one of his fundraisers and he held forth for quite some time on uh, development issues and, and, and how to fix the education system. And, and I, it was just riveting. He, he was so knowledgeable about it uh, and so well versed and was able to articulate it uh, in, in such a clear fashion that it just impressed me, um, you know, very profoundly. Uh, the other thing that he taught me, uh, I think, is the, the passion that he has for his work and the, the caring way that he really approaches. Uh, his his feelings towards his constituents and people, especially those uh, who who need someone like Mark uh, to to help be their champion. Uh, and the other uh, lesson uh, is is his persistence. Uh, he and let's face it, the man is a, is a living embodiment of the argument for term limits. <laughs> and uh, you know he he just um, uh, he has this way of never giving up. Uh, on, on anything and just keeps coming back and back armed with new arguments and more proofs uh, and, and to me that's, that's a very important quality uh, and I think the, other, the, the last thing is, is his utter fearlessness where he's never afraid to wade in to the, mo the, the, the deepest thicket uh, the most emotionally charged situations uh, not with guns blazing but really again armed with 
with good arguments and good ideas about how to convince people, move them off their positions and, and maybe towards uh, some new perspective. So uh, for all of those things, Mark, and, and a lot of others, thanks a lot and good luck. We're going to continue working with you. I want to um, thank Mark. I uh, was very heartened by the outcome of the election, and there's two things that um, really come to mind when I think about Mark's um, work, and uh, they are, he has a, a very um, progressive approach on both local and national issues, and I've appreciated that during my tenure on the council because of the many local issues that we've worked on together and um, achieved uh, important progress on. And the second thing is the big picture approach that he takes both to city policy and to the, the county. Um, and it was uh, for that reason that I was very happy when he decided to, to go in the at-large direction because I think he will, will bring that, that big picture approach um, uh, to his position on the county council. Um, I'm proud of the campaign he ran. I'm proud of the uh, collaborative style that he has honed over the years. And um, uh, I, I, I believe that because of his long tenure on the city council, it's, uh, he, he has a different equation for success. And many people uh, would have thought it was a long shot to to win the fifth time around, but in Mark's case, it was uh, fifth times the charm. So, um, Mark, I just want you to know how much I appreciate the, the uh, projects that you and I have um, spearheaded together and, and the progress that we've made on them. Um, the, the fire station comes to mind. Uh, the Metropolitan Branch Trail uh, and Metro Development were both um, uh, helped along by your uh, your assistance and the city manager's um, uh, transition uh, was uh, also an important accomplishment. And that's just uh, what I know well from, from being on the council for five years. But I know you've been on much longer than that, and I know you've, you've accomplished many things that you can be proud of and that you can build on as you um, rise to the next level. So, thank you. Um, before I open it up to public comment, I just wanted to make sure that people had a copy of the uh, resolution that we're looking at. I think there's some copies over there. When you look at it, you'll notice that the margins are a little narrower than usual. A number of people contributed to the resolution, and we tried to put in a little bit about all the things that Mark's done. And when you try and cram all the things that Mark's done onto one sheet of paper, you end up with very narrow margins because he's done a great deal in his 19 plus, 19 years on the council. and more years as a community activist before that. Okay, um, is there any public comments on this resolution? Anybody want to make a comment on the resolution? Don't everyone look at everyone else. <laughs> Everybody wants to be last. Well, I'll close the comment period if we won't get somebody to speak. Okay. <laughs> I'm Howard Cohn. Um, you know, during this long, long uh, election year, I ran into a number of people and I would say to them, you know, I think Mark's going to win this time. And um, more often than not, they would say to me, well, you know, I have mixed feelings about that. Uh, and, the, and we're talking about friends of Mark here, uh, supporters of his. Um, it is true, as I as I heard that, it, there are reasons to have mixed feelings. Um, you know, some of that's already been spoken to. But um, one person who told me that was Tom Perez. Now, that's because Tom has a daughter who attends Rolling Terrace, and Tom's daughter was about to enter Mark's math class. And so um, there are many, many parents and students much loved, uh, who, who much loved Mark over the years, and not only at Rolling Terrace, but other kids who he tutored on the, in his free time. Uh, I myself referred a number of students to him. This, this is a side of Mark probably never appreciated by those of us out here in the 
in the gin mill of politics. Um, and of course, his neighbors, his constituents in Ward 5, um, Mark is someone who never forgot that half the people in this town live in apartments, not in houses. And he has stood up for Ward 5. But he's also stood up and worked hard for everybody across the city. You know, and that's how I know Mark, is, uh, as someone who's worked at a citywide level and, in fact, at a countywide level. And now, of course, he gets to step onto that bigger stage, work on those issues that will be the good fortune not only of us in Tacoma Park, but everyone who lives in Montgomery County. Um, I will say that, you know, I, I've done a number of these tributes, and most of the time, um, I have to say at the end, well, you know, good luck. I hope to see you someday. Um, but with Mark, even though he's leaving the city council, he's not really going anywhere. So, Mark, uh, congratulations. <laughs> see you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm Eileen Sobeck. Um, I live on Carroll Avenue. And when I first moved here in 1990, Mark was my city council member, and I was in Ward 5. Um, and I didn't quite realize how lucky I was until I um, realized that we were going to be redistricted out of Ward 5. And I came and testified here before the council about how I thought that my part of the neighborhood, which would, had always been in Montgomery County, it made sense for it to be to remain part of Ward 5. And, blah, blah, blah. And while I, I really think that that was fabulous testimony and I really believed it, um, <clears throat> there was actually a, a pretty big part of me that was really worried about losing Mark as an advocate for my part of the neighborhood. Um, and um, it turns out that, that we didn't lose Mark as an advocate for our neighborhood, even though we um, are now in Ward 2 and we're very happy with our representation. Um, we now have more than one advocate who really um, thinks about issues that are important to our community. And I've worked on some specific issues with Mark, and nobody has provided um, wiser counsel. And um, I, I think that he's one of the few examples. Um, I'm in public service, but and I see a lot of people who, who work for various levels of government. But I see very few people who um, are as passionate and as principled as Mark is. And to be able to do that day in and day out without the least, without one grain of hypocrisy is really incredible. And we really owe it to you, Mark, for all the things that Tacoma Park has accomplished and all the things that it is um, known to stand for throughout the community of the state <clears throat> and the larger area. And I'm actually thinking that we're going to be annoyed at Mark pretty soon because he is so principled that he's going to do what's right for the county, even if we find it irritating in Tacoma Park. He is going to look out for the um, larger interests of, of the county and the, his constituency at, lar at large, even when it's not what we want here at Tacoma Park. I'm sure that he'll help us bring home the bacon here when it's uh, <clears throat> appropriate, but um, I think that is the mark of his um, courage and passion. And when I first started um, paying attention to the council and council issues, um, I sort of thought of Mark as being kind of a firebrand and kind of going out on a limb. but. Um, in working with him on specific issues, what I've actually marveled at is his skill as a reasonable negotiator and um, uh, his ability to step, as somebody on the council said, to step back from a very charged situation and find out what is reasonable and what is really the best solution for, for all parties is really um, a rare quality and one that we should really value and that we are really lucky, going to be lucky to have at the county level. So thank you, Mark. Good luck. My name is Hank Prensky. I live at 7921 Sligo Creek Parkway. I'm here to speak about Mark Elrich. That's not Ehrlich. <laughs> I had the pleasure to serve with Mark on the City Council for two terms, um, 1989 to 1993. These were his second and third of ten terms on the City Council. 
During the time that I spent with him, Mark was my most reliable ally as a progressive political force here in Tacoma Park. He championed affordable housing in the guise of the city's rent stabilization laws. He always took seriously the city's laws related to our nuclear free zone law, which attempts to deny the profitability of the nuclear weapons industry. Mark supported democratic and humanitarian efforts to help the residents of Santa Marta in El Salvador, our sister city, who were ravaged then by the U.S. sponsored wars on the poor of Central America. Mark, in fact, traveled to El Salvador to represent the city, but was unable to leave the capital city due to the extreme danger and the unwillingness of the U.S. supported government to tolerate any attention being drawn to their repression perpetrated against their own citizens. I was lucky enough to follow Mark several years later and travel to Santa Marta and be able to bring the good wishes and material support of the people of Tacoma Park to that war-ravaged sister city. Mark's worked long and hard um, on other progressive issues. We worked together on the Share the Vote campaign that ultimately resulted in Tacoma Park granting the right to vote to, to residents of the city who didn't happen to be citizens of the United States. We also, Mark has also been interested, <laughs> we have also interacted outside of the council chambers. For quite a few years we've met regularly on the green and grassy fields of Tacoma Park's Recreation Department Co-Ed Softball League. We both managed to play third base for opposing teams. He was always a little bit faster, a little stronger, and a little smarter, and I would venture a little bit luckier than I. Of course, he was also about a decade younger than I. Mark was also my friend and my next door neighbor. He worked to protect and preserve our neighborhood with his creative and frequently innovative approaches to the Washington Adventist Hospital's long and confusing battle to ultimately leave this city. The uh, $750,000 donation that the Adventist Hospital has made over the next several years to support the community center is an idea that Mark brought to the table. All this is not to mention Mark's brilliance on development issues which will be a major import on the County Council. We have a strange situation of losing a terrific representative, but we're gaining a terrific representative. And as our British friends would say, the council member is dead. Long live the council member. <laughs> Hooray for Mark. Now I'm from Pinecrest. Um, it's been a lot of years. Some of them's been up, some of them's been down with Mark. But he's always come out here. And sometimes he was, it was really good to be critical whenever we would have a problem. And it just made me be even tougher and come out and find the right answers when I needed them if he'd come against me. So that just made me fight even harder to find the right answers when I needed them. I have a message from you from Jasmine and all the kids. They say they're going to miss you. You are going to leave school, right? Yeah, they're going to miss you. So all of them say, um, good luck, don't forget them, and make sure that you remember everybody here so that you show up for all the events. Now that's from the kids as well as from the area too. So Pinecrest says good luck to you as we did you down at the VFW when we had the big to-do. I missed some of your faces, but most of you showed up. So thank you for being our representative in the area. Um, like Bruce, you're always there. So uh, the rest of you, get alert to what he's done, because we need a lot more done. Bye-bye. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm going to talk partly as city attorney. Um, I've been city attorney the entire time that Mark's been on the council, and so I've got lots to say about that. And then also to talk as both an individual and a constituent in Ward 5, and a parent in Ward 5. Um, first, as, a, as the lawyer for the city, I want to say 
Mark really knows how to challenge us. Uh, what, I, what I enjoyed about that is if we came out in a position on a piece of legislation or even a particular issue where Mark was representing a particular constituent, and Mark disagreed with us, he did not let go. This issue of him being tenacious and really pushing to the limit on behalf of, uh, of someone in his, in his uh, constituency it can't be stressed enough. I really, really have um, learned from that. I've admired that. And I think we've made some, we, we also have pushed the envelope as a city in terms of our laws because of that attitude. The second thing I want to say is that uh, we've often, in the, in the resolution, and I think some of the other speakers have talked about Marx wanting to represent those who are poor or less powerful, minorities, et cetera. And I think Mark would not put it that way. Mark, tell me if I'm right. I think what Mark would say is that his approach is not about individual charity. It's about empowerment of communities through systemic change. And I think Mark works very hard to see things in terms of a systemic picture and try to make our community and our county now one where economic justice prevails rather than sort of it be a trickle-down theory that has happened in many cases before. Mark and I um, are both products of the anti-war movement in our college days where many of us felt that electoral politics was really not politically correct. And I think one of the really exciting things is that Mark has now become an embodiment of that not necessarily being true. That in fact, through electoral politics, we may really be able to present and create a community uh, with changes and with, um, with our values uh, that, that will, will, will eventually really change not only our country but the world. Um, I think that both of my children have seen that. When they meet Mark, they get very excited. They wanted to work on electoral politics. He does stand for that in their mind, and I think he does for, um, for the, the newer generations. And for that, I really think we owe him an enormous uh, debt of gratitude. So mainly I wanted to sum up by saying that we really will miss you on city government, but it'll be great to have you in county government because we need your help there. Thank you. I'm Sabrina Barron. I live on Ethan Allen Avenue, and I'm also the president of Historic Tacoma. Um, I wanted to talk about um, Mark on, on two levels, which it seems like a lot of people are doing in this process. In my day job, I teach history at the University of Maryland in the very department that's uh, proud to claim Mark as an illustrious uh, alum. And I think history uh, is the only discipline and the best training for anything and everything you can possibly want to do. And I like to think that contributes to um, Mark's insight and, and passion on various issues. Um, on another level, it, it's been a pleasure to uh, work with Mark. I appreciate all the service he's given to this community and to this council, and I'm sure we'll see the same thing at, at the county level, and we look forward to working with him uh, at the county level. The thing I appreciate about Mark is uh, not only the passion that he brings to issues, but the fact that he's a straight shooter, and he has the guts to say the things that need to be said when they need to be said as they need to be said. Um, no political um, correctness. Um, he has illustrated in the way his campaign for council was conducted his aversion to uh, greed and being swayed by the almighty dollar, which I think is something that we need so much in politics today, and I'm sure we're going to see the benefits of that as you, uh, as you go uh, to the county council. So thanks for everything you've done here, and thanks for everything you're going to do there. We're looking forward to it. I'm Lorraine Purcell. I live on Tacoma Avenue. And um, Mark, every time you ran before for county council, I always kind of, it was very schizophrenic for me. I always kind of wanted you to lose because I didn't want to lose you. And it was very relieved, actually, when you came back to us. And that's because you've always been such a good, strong voice for community. And we, we certainly always needed to have you there, but I must say that um, I am really happy that you won because 
it's time now. I think that um, the great Montgomery County cookie jar to development interests needs to be shut, and there needs to be an awful lot of governmental reform. And I can't think of anyone who can do that better than you because you are so very independent and so very ethical. And we need you there now. This is a very bad time for Montgomery County. I think Clarksburg is just one little blip. And I suspect that as time goes on, we will find much, much more that needs to be reformed in government. And I hope there is a wave of reform coming to government. And I think because you're there, it certainly will. And so while I hate to lose you, I think it's time and we're looking for you to get that old shovel out and do that reform. Thank you. Are there any other comments? I think Bruce had one additional thing he wanted to add. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make brief mention of uh, one area of Mark's abilities that uh, nobody has mentioned. Uh, I don't know how generally known it is, but Mark is also a playwright who has uh, written some screenplays and uh, hopped them in Hollywood. And I don't know whether you're going to have time to do that with your increased uh, responsibilities, but it's just one more facet of Mark that uh, is pretty special. Thank you. Can I say something? Sure. Um, I, want to, I want to thank you all. We should take the vote first and then kick. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, it looks like you made it. Any abstentions? <laughs> this, is, um, this is a really difficult time for me in some ways. I, I know I should be thoroughly excited and delighted, but I also recognize that I'm giving up a lot. Um, one of the things I'm giving up is teaching, which has meant a lot to me. And uh, it was really interesting meeting parents who confessed to me that they didn't vote for me because they voted for their child. And they, <laughs> they were like, they wanted me to lose so I could keep teaching this year. And and I thought it was just, it was actually nice that they came and told me that. Uh, if, if there was any reason not to vote for me, that was the best reason because people cared about their kids. And I was, I was really moved by people who actually came forward and told that to me. Um, and it is hard leaving teaching. It's hard leaving teaching, especially because I'm in, it's in this community. And I'm, I'm lucky because I've been, I guess, like the old-fashioned teacher that you, you know, you'd see in the movies, that the teacher lived in the neighborhood, shopped in the neighborhood, saw all the kids and the parents in the neighborhood, could go over and knock on a kid's door and torment them when they least expected it. Or I could run into them in the grocery store and say, oh, that's your parents. Let's have a little conversation. Um, so I, I felt like I had a really special relationship um, with the children I taught and with the community. And it certainly um, always informed me in terms of how I looked at some of the decisions we made on the council. Um, when you see kids who come to school without medical care and who come to school hungry, then you think about the implications of all the decisions you make. And to, to be in a county as wealthy as Montgomery County and a city as prosperous as Tacoma Park and to confront hungry children and children without medical care, um, people whose housing is unstable and they don't know where they're going to be living from month to month, um, that's always affected how I, how I look at things. The other thing that's really hard to do is give up this seat on the council. I've been doing this for 19 years. It's been a wonderful adventure. I, I can't think of anything I would rather have done with my life and with my time than, than to have served on this council. Um, this community of Tacoma Park has been a wonderful place for me. I, I moved here, I guess, 26 or 27 years ago. I think it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, serving on the council is probably uh, and the level of reward is up there with, 
raising my own children, being a teacher to other people's children, and being able to do something for the community. Um, it's, it's just offered me the opportunity to, I think, have a meaningful existence in a way that I only imagined was possible. Um, somebody talks about coming out of the 60s, and you know, I'm very much part of that generation and, and, and shared um, the general distrust of government and the people who sit in these places, in the seats that we're in here. And none of you mentioned my, my early, early days when I would appear, but none of you were on the council then. When I would appear before the council meetings in my long hair, my beard, and my, um, my charming t-shirt collection, which was always good for comments. And, you know, so, and those are some of the things I've had to give up because the charming t-shirt collection and the long hair and the beard just, um, they, they were for a different purpose and at a different time. But um, I, went to a, I went to a conference in the early 80s in Minneapolis. It was a co-op conference. Uh, I don't know if anybody mentioned, I was one of the founders of the Carl Park Co-op here. I actually worked on gutting and renovating the first building and I was one of the workers in the first collective that, that ran the store. And we went to a co-op conference and I had the opportunity to meet some people from ACORN. And I think some of you recognize ACORN as the name of a community organizing group that does work all around the country. And they were talking about the political situation there and how they were tired of electing people who they, they would work for on the promise that person would, would support their issue after they got elected. And invariably after electing people, they would start hearing the, oh, you know, I have to weigh all these different interests and, you know, what are you going to do for me next time? And the woman who was one of the lead organizers in ACORN said she thought it was time that we start electing our own. That we elect the people who believe in the things we believe in, who want to work for the things that we want to work for and stop electing people who we only could hope we can persuade to do the right thing but never be certain that they're going to do the right thing because they really don't believe it. They're calculating how many votes it takes to get elected. And that made me think about what I was doing. And it rekindled my interest in, in getting involved in electoral politics. And I, um, I went up on the city council here in 1987. And it was, it has been just a wonderful, wonderful ride. Um, I've got to say that, you know, that this council in the city of Tacoma Park, I think, has matured enormously. And the fact that I could get elected, that Peter Franco is going to be sitting in Annapolis, that Tom had a very good chance of winding up um, winning an election, says a lot about the maturity of Tacoma Park because 20 years ago, uh, running from Tacoma Park was a curse. And as someone who's run five times, I can tell you that the assumption was if you were from Tacoma Park, you were from uh, Berkeley East, you were from a different part of the planet, you were, you know, there were a whole bunch of assumptions about what it meant to be from Tacoma Park. But in the time I've been on the councils, the members of this council have worked tirelessly at every level of government on a myriad of issues that has established Tacoma Park as a credible place to be from. Yes, we're progressive and we, you know, we haven't backtracked on any of the progressive things we ever did, but we've also demonstrated an ability to, to work on the nuts and bolts issues that matter to lots of regular people every day. And I think that certainly served me well in the election, but I think it served the Comer Park well over, over the last several years. It's really been to our benefit. Um, I knew that it was to our benefit in this election when one of the people I was running against in the general addressed the crowd and, and told him that the reason he was running is he was going to prevent Tacoma Park's takeover of Montgomery County. And I listened to that and I looked at the crowd's reaction and it was like a lead balloon. It didn't evoke anything. There was no, what does he mean by that? And, you know, what is, and I thought the fact that it didn't, it didn't engender any kind of response was symbolic of how far Tacoma Park has come. And I thought that was a very good thing. It was good for me, but I think it's good for the city in general and I think it speaks to the work that a lot of people have done, not just things that I've done. And so I, mean, I, I feel like I've been part of something that's been a growing and evolving institution in the 19 years that I've been on the council. Um, I know that all of you up here, and I'm sure whoever, you know, the people who come afterwards, um, 
that you'll know how to find me in Rockville. Um, because you've gotten so good at going to talk to people, um, I'm sure that I'll be one of the first people you will come and talk to. And, and I can assure you, I mean, one of the things I learned in this election is how little difference I think there is between Tacoma Park and any place else in the county. When you get down to fundamental issues and fundamental things that people care about, there's not a Tacoma Park interest versus a Bethesda interest versus a, a Rockville interest. We share pretty similar concerns. We go to the same schools, we drive on the same roads, we have the same lousy bus system and the same, same miserable mass transit system that is nowhere what it should be. Um, we confront the same problems and we have the same opportunities. So I feel that it's more likely than anything I do the benefits Tacoma, benefits the rest of the county, and anything I do the benefits the rest of the county will benefit Tacoma. Um, sort of like a progressive spin on what's good for General Motors is good for the country. Um, <clears throat> I think a more enlightened way of looking at it. Um, <laughs> so I think that uh, one other person I need to mention, and that's Sam Abbott, and Sam's not here. But I think like a lot of people in the city, I, I came here during Sam's time and was here for his election um, as mayor. And the energy and the sense of possibility that came with Sam and in that era, I think, is what fundamentally has made Tacoma Park a different place than the sleepy Adventist community that it was beforehand. And Sam was probably the first political practitioner that I met that I actually believed that he actually intended to make his vision into reality. And I thought it was inspiring to work with somebody and be around somebody who actually believed that what you could imagine can also be possible. And then you spend your time that you have here trying to make those things possible. So I think I'd be remiss to, to not mention the debt I think I feel I owe to Sam and I think a lot of other people owe to him as well. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to work on the council and the county council and I think the challenges that I face are are pretty significant, but I think that I, I take a lot of comfort in how my election turned out. First of all, Tacoma Park provided enormous numbers for me in the election. And in the primary, where it was especially crucial, where you're talking about winning by a few thousand votes as opposed to winning by 90,000 votes, what came out of Tacoma Park um, made me first in District 5, first in District 20, and, and State Delegate District 20. This was the backbone of my support, and the precincts here were enormously supportive of me, and, and I'm very, very grateful for that. It, it, it certainly, I think, made an enormous difference in my campaign. Um, I also ran a campaign on people power, and I hope that you know people look at that and some other changes around the state. I mean, mine was a race with no developer money, and my signs and all my literature had no developer influence, uh, prominently featured on the front of it. And I was told by the political pundits to take that off my sign. Uh, some of my friends who I consider on the progressive side of labor said, get that off your sign. And I said, no, I'm not taking it off my sign and I'm not taking it off my literature. I said, when I handed out a piece of literature to somebody and they saw no developer influence, that was the first thing people looked at and you could just watch people nod their heads and say it's about time. And you know, it didn't matter whether they were Republicans, independents, or Democrats. Most people in this county know we've been getting a raw deal. And most people in the county want to see a change. And I feel that I benefited from the, from the desire to see a change. I think in some way I demonstrated that it's actually possible to run a campaign on people power and a campaign that relies on the energy of the citizens that doesn't depend on the money that comes out of the development community. And I'm proud to say that I have not a dime from that side of the table, which doesn't mean that I don't listen to it. Because I will listen to absolutely anybody, and I will talk with anybody, but no one's going to be able to come and, and, and put the squeeze on and say, you know, you wouldn't be there for, for the money we made possible to buy your ads and do your literature. And no one's going to be able to say that to me except the people. And that's where any politician should get their strength from. They should get their strength and their power from the people who want them to, do, to be their representative not from people who can fill our campaign coffers with so much money that they turn us into irresistible forces. I would rather be victorious the way I won and lose the times I lost the way I lost than to have figured out a different way to win 
where I would have been less true to myself and not able to do the kind of things that I believe in. I've, I've always been an activist, and I tried to take an activist role in this council. Um, I've never been shy about working with community groups, uh, whether it was the hospital or the anti-ICC people or the anti-incinerator people or any number of issues, people trying to preserve the Falklands and Silver Spring. I've always felt that I had an obligation not just to sit up here and say, now I'm an arbiter. I'm still an activist. I'm still out of the community. And I'm going to continue to work with people in the community. Um, I don't plan on changing my role in being uh, a sphinx that people bring positions to and I nod yes or no. I'm going to go out and work with citizens at the community level, um, help organize people when they need to be organized, help give advice when people want to advice and listen when people want to be heard and those are the things I want to bring to the county council and those are the things I think are, are the kind of things that can transform politics in our county and, and I think that I'm, I'm in a good position to be able to do that now. Um, I want to thank everybody up here. You've been a great group to work with. Um, this has been, uh, it's been challenging. I think we've, you know, gotten a lot done. You know, I'll be the first to admit that probably the, the most difficult, the least successful thing has been the inability to get a gym here and the problems that came out of the community center. But I think that, that you look at that and you say, yeah, that's something that got messed up. There are a lot of other things that have been right in this city and that have been good in this city. And that I think you look at all that on balance, it's been a much more successful um, series of years in the city than, than failures. And I don't think one event um, should not become the, the way that we judge um, everything that, get, that gets done. I, I noticed that the resolution, one thing you didn't mention, that as a physical conservative, I wish you had, which is both the, uh, the decision to do an equipment replacement reserve, <clears throat> which leveled out our tax rates and, and made it so we weren't wondering where we were going to get the money to buy equipment every year, and the bonding decision that we made a couple of years ago right before the price of asphalt and concrete went through the roof, um, making pretty conclusive the wisdom of that decision given what it would have cost us to buy those materials over the next several years. Uh, we, we made the right decision to take out a bond and the interest on that bond is a fraction of what we would have wound up paying um, at the inflated price of materials today. So I'm proud of actually having been part of a good physically conservative decision and I hope to bring some of that physical conservatism to the county council. Um, anybody who thinks that because I'm liberal and progressive that I have an unlimited appetite for spending money is absolutely wrong. Anybody who's seen me up here and knows my, particularly those who went back to the line item budget days where I would debate whether we should buy an NCR um, cash register or an off-brand ca cash register to save $500 knows that I'm not interested in figuring out how to spend as much money as possible. Um, anyway, uh, this is my last meeting. Uh, I will be back. Uh, Tom had a tradition of coming and talking to the council, and I certainly f feel like I, I will do the same. I will have to do this for lots of communities, and I promised you know, people, different civics around the county, that I will be there to talk to them. But this is one place that I'll come back to. You guys know where I live. Um, you know my email addresses, all of them, I think. And. Um, and I think you're going to find you know, the people who work with me are going to be really accessible and civic-oriented. So the door will always be open. And I look forward to keeping and continuing to work with all of you. And thank you for allowing me to say as much as I got to say tonight. But it's been, it's, it's been really good.
Well, Mark mentioned that it is uh, his last meeting this evening, and the next item that we uh, need to take care of is setting up a process to elect someone to represent Ward 5 uh, once he leaves. And so the next item on the agenda is the first reading of an ordinance regarding the Ward 5 special election, uh, which is set for January 30th, 2007. Someone want to move it? Move it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, there's the city clerk has done a very good job of sort of pulling all the pieces together for um, this uh, ordinance and I think it's also worth noting that this is also going to be the first um, election that we have that utilizes instant runoff voting um, I don't know how many candidates will put their names forward but if there are more than two then um, instant runoff voting will come into play and so uh, this could be um, an interesting election in many ways. Any, um, any comments from the council on this ordinance? Is there any public comment on this ordinance at first reading? All right, uh, seeing no comment, this is first reading of the ordinance. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ordinance passes at first reading. Um, that concludes our regular meeting agenda, and we will now move to the presentation of our uh, annual financial report for fiscal 2006. Good evening. My name is Keith Novak. I'm a uh, partner with Clifton Gunderson. Uh, we are the auditor, external auditors for the city, and we're here tonight to present uh, our report as well as uh, our feared management letter. Um, and so what I'd like to do, I don't want to take a whole lot of the council's time this evening. Um, there were a couple changes made to the statements this year, uh, one of which is uh, we prepared, or I should say management prepared, a comprehensive annual financial report, which will be submitted to GFOA uh, for their Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting Program. This is new to the city this year, but not new to the city uh, in concept. When I first uh, started working on the audit of the city uh, a number of years ago, the city was obtaining the certificate on a regular basis. At some point, the city had decided to drop out of the program um, and has now decided to get back in. Uh, what this means is that your financial statements are a lot more comprehensive than they have been in the past. Generally accepted accounting principles require a certain level of disclosure and financial statement be prepared. Uh, a comprehensive annual financial report is a level above that. And what the differences are, quite frankly, are in there are three basic sections uh, to a CAFR, the introductory section, the financial section, and the statistical section. The financial section is the minimum requirement under generally accepted accounting principles. The introductory section, which includes a letter of transmittal, an organizational chart, and a, li and a list of elected and appointed officials is something over and above that's required under the uh, program uh, for the certificate. The other section that is different uh, is the statistical section, which gives trend information uh, on various things in the city, such as property taxes, assessments, and things of that nature over a multi-year period so that by looking at that you can see how the city has progressed, uh, where they had been spending their money uh, from time to time, how net assets had increased, etc. 
there's also some demographic statistics in there about the city itself. Um, so there's a lot of really good information in there. Uh, the only part of these financial statements that are truly mine in my firms is the independent auditor's report. Everything else in these financial statements are the representation of management. Uh, and once again, our financial, our auditor's report, which is on page eight, is an unqualified opinion, uh, which is the highest level of opinion that can be rendered uh, in a financial statement. Outside of that, there's not a whole lot else in these financial statements that differ from last year to this year. Uh, there, are no new, there are no new note disclosures uh, to be concerned with. Um, there are no new disclosure requirements to be concerned with. Um, with that said, um, I know that you all have just received these uh, recently. If anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer anything that you may have. And then the council have questions. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure. I, I just got this tonight. I might mention this is exactly the same document minus sort of its presentation that was included in the agenda packet. It's okay. just basically it's bound uh, for your color version. Right. Of what was in your agenda? Okay. Yeah, these uh, <laughs> these do tend to get rushed towards the end, so we were up against a little bit of a deadline. Well, thank you. I just wondered if you could. Uh, uh, kind of summarize quickly any issues that uh, you see that we need to resolve in the coming year? With the only the only issue that was coming up uh, from an accounting standpoint that would be required to be um, dealt with uh, by any council uh, isn't really going to pertain to the city of Tacoma Park. Uh, you're lucky you're dodging one. Um, other post-employment benefits is the hottest issue out there and luckily uh, it doesn't pertain to uh, Tacoma Park. Um, and that has to do with funding of health care that's promised to employees once they retire. Uh, we don't have, or I should say Tacoma Park doesn't have that benefit, so that's not an issue. Outside of that, um, I think the, the, the city um, has been doing a good job in I, monitoring. I, I, I tried to contrast it with yeah. the recent previous years where there were some uh, some issues that needed to be resolved in our bookkeeping and well we do we do have a couple management letter comments however they're nowhere near uh, where we were a couple years ago uh, as I recall two years ago I was meeting with this council sometime in I believe it was February or March uh, right. because we couldn't get the books closed uh, and we couldn't get our audit done and last year we improved upon that, and this year once again it was improved upon. Uh, and this year's audit went quite smoothly, uh, which is the way it had been up until three years ago. Well, that's uh, certainly reassuring to hear that, and thank you, Mrs. Brooks, for that. Uh, I, you know, one thing that came up this year uh, with uh, one of our parks was that, uh, you know, we had to change the the locks on the way we handle our our uh, keys for for people and distribute the keys for the community to use the park and it was brought up as a as an audit issue this is something that our auditor would uh, raise objection to and I just wonder if that's something if the, the city procedures are normally something that you look at or if that's just the financial report well we normally look at procedures as they affect financial statements um, so if for instance you were giving keys to a safe to numerous people that would be an issue that we would be looking at if you were giving keys to someone to open the door to be able to use the park after hours that may or may not be something we look at because it may or may not have a financial impact on, on the city as a whole are procedures like that something though that uh, because of the potential for liability uh, that your company would normally uh, be able to do? <laughs> we could look at it. It's generally not something we do look at because what we're looking at are whether your financial statements are fairly stated or not. And a potential liability from someone using a park wouldn't necessarily um, go, fall under that realm. 
What we'd be looking at more would be defalcations, basically people taking things from the city, taking assets from the city that didn't belong to them, overstatement of assets, understatement of liabilities, and proper statement of net assets. Those are what we're concerned with in our audit, and those are the controls that we're looking at. Well, there's an area within our city and some procedures within our city that does handle property of value that I wonder if you do take a look at, and that's the property that is seized or confiscated by the police department. Do you look at that, and do you look at the bookkeeping arrangements there? That's normally one of the areas that we do take a look at, and one of the things that we do look at is not only the control over the assets, but also whether those assets are available to the city, because under that program, once a case has been adjudicated and the state's attorney makes the city aware that the case has been adjudicated and the seizure can then be perfected, those assets then become the assets of the city, and up until that point in time, they're not really the assets of the city because they may have to be returned at some point. So in your audit of the city then this year, you did take a look at the inventory control over that property and how that property is disposed of and the reports and the reports that are necessary to be filed with the state? Yes. And you found no problems in those areas? Not that I can recall, no. No material issues. And can you tell me how the valuable property is disposed of? You're talking as far as the fixed assets? I'm talking about property that's been seized, such as, let's say, a jewelry recently covered. Right. Okay. And how is that property disposed of? Everything that's going to be disposed is signed, excuse me, is signed off by the police chief prior to anything being disposed. The city or the county finance department will not release or remove anything off their books until the information is, until a release is given to them, signed by the police chief. At that time, once it is signed by the police chief, that's when it's processed. Excuse me. And looking and comparing, one of the things we do is compare fiscal year to fiscal year to see movement in the account. If there is some movement, we look at an itemized list of transactions. We have a materiality level. We select certain transactions based on materiality. And then we backtrack to the authorization for that documentation being released. We look for signatures of the police chief, who is the designated person to approve a release of seized property. We also look back to any kind of court cases that were, or legal letters or documents stating what was the outcome of the court case. Okay. So if property then was released because the court case was over or for whatever reason it was deemed no longer necessary to be held, then that property is disposed of in some way? Sometimes, yes. What happens is you generally have some kind of legal letter stating what was the disposition of the case. If the property was deemed to be returned back to the individual, still you still will have a release from the police chief signing the release of that property back to the individual. The individual is named on this release that the police chief signs. I guess I'll give you an example. You know, we used to have, the city used to auction cars off, and we would periodically see the auction of vehicles that had been either abandoned or seized, and no longer see those advertisements for auctions like that. And so I've been curious, you know, how the property was, you know, how those vehicles are disposed of at this point in time, and I thought maybe you could shed some light on that. Well, generally, from our last couple of years that I have been doing the audit, it's been mainly cash. So far, no property. I haven't seen the release of actual property. The property is in cash. So I have not seen auction of cars unless the cars were disposed of, and then you have the sign of the police chief. But I have not been aware of any auction of cars. Most of the movement in the seized property 
account that has been documented on the city books has been cashed, has been returned back to the individual. There seems to be a gap in the in the audit. If you, I mean, there's a heck of a lot of cars towed out of the city in a month. Uh, those cars are going somewhere, and they're not all returned to individuals. Well, when you say towed out of the city, I'm saying see cars that are either abandoned in the city or mm-hmm. uh, that may be a county. Uh, now, that may be a county issue. Yes. Uh, no, well, in the city, we have a we have a tow service that, that okay. takes them. We have a, they have a property that they hold the cars on, and those cars uh, used to be disposed of in the tombs of uh, you know quite a few cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, every that, couple of months, and that, that's not happening. And, and I don't hear you giving me any confidence that uh, that those cars are well. Quite frankly, being I did, for. Quite frankly, I didn't come prepared to discuss disposal of cars this evening. Um, I can certainly go back and take a look in our work papers uh, and uh, get back to you with some more information on that. I really appreciate it. Sure. Not just vehicles. That was an example, but I also no. I understand. Think you know, there's other properties such as uh, jewelry and, and uh, gaming devices and things like that that are seized, and I would just like to make sure that they are properly accounted for and properly disposed of and that the uh, money that is re, uh, returned mm-hmm. to the city uh, through any disposal is properly accounted for. Okay. Well, we can look into that for you. Um, I can say I do recall uh, years ago um, one of the first years I was on this particular account, a uh, Rolls-Royce Corniche was uh, seized and actually auctioned out on the uh, steps of the, uh, of the uh, uh, county uh, center. Um, so, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking right. about. Uh, I just have to go back and, and double check and take another look at the work papers to be able to, uh, to answer your question more fully. I really appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. No problem. Good evening. Uh, Since most of the folks at home don't have access yet to this Mm -hmm. document, uh, I wonder if uh, you could just take a minute uh, looking at at two issues. One is uh, the uh, financial reporting in general, uh, and then also uh, the relative uh, health of our finances as (coughs) measured by indices such as public debt to uh, city income, for example, uh, how uh, in, the, in the phrase of New York's Mayor Koch, as he would say, how we doing in those two areas? Okay. Well, with regard, the, the best way to, to really analyze financial statements are your net assets. And net assets, first off, these statements are in two levels, okay? One is in a financial position level, that is, where are we today? Uh, And then another level is at the financial condition level, and that is not only where are we today, but where does it look like we're going to be down the road? Um, From a financial condition standpoint, uh, the best statement to look at is on page 21, which is the statement of net assets. And in that particular statement, the primary number uh, to look at to answer your question uh, would be unrestricted net assets. Um, Because those are net assets that at some point in time will turn into spendable assets. While you have $17.9 million worth of net assets, $12.2 million of that is basically bricks and mortar, things that you're not going to sell. This community center, for instance. Um, so that's not going to turn into uh, cash, if you will, or an asset that can be utilized for appropriation. Uh, so really, the $4.2 million is, is what you'd be looking at. And with respect to... Um, you know, to the city, that's about the best I've seen the city in in a while. I mean, the city is, it, from that standpoint, uh, it looks to be in, in pretty good shape. Okay. The other, where are we today, is best depicted on page 23, which is the governmental fund statement. And on page 23, again, what we look at is we look at undesignated fund balance. But there, what we're looking at is we're looking at the undesignated fund balance 
in terms of your budget. How many months liquidity, if you will, do you have? How many months worth of fund balance do you have saved up uh, in your budget? Or how much of your budget do you have saved up in your fund balance so that if you hit a blip in the road, uh, would you be able to, how would you be able to weather that storm? Your budgeted expenditures this year were $17 million. Your undesignated was $2.3 million. Um, doing the math on that, that's roughly about 15%, which is, again, a good place to be from that measurement standpoint. Generally, um, the uh, bond rating agencies are looking at something around 8%. Okay, five to eight percent they think is good. Fifteen percent is is very good. Um, there are some jurisdictions that get as high as thirty-five to forty percent, um, and there are some jurisdictions that are much lower. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, the city appears uh, to be in good shape. Now, as far as the statistical, and I really didn't come prepared to talk about. Um, the bond is debt per capita, but if you take a look at page 68, uh, which is table number nine, it will give you the bond of debt per capita, which has gone down. Um, it reached a high of about $400 in 2005 and is going down again. Uh, the city had been as low as $95 per capita at one point in time. Debt is one of those things that people or, you know, fear, but it can be a very, very useful tool, as Council Member Elrich had uh, pointed out earlier. Uh, while you went into debt to do some uh, road work, uh, you probably saved a lot of money in the long run. So just looking at debt by itself uh, can be uh, misleading as well. I don't know if that... Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, and they may be more for Ms. Brooks than for you, but uh, one of them, I think, ties into something you were just going over. Uh, my questions are all in the supplemental stuff, um, starting at page 55. Um, what I wanted to be sure that I understand is the, the variance from the final budget and how that plays out to the fund balance, because it looks like on pages 55, 6, and 7, that uh, we all, all the numbers were, the overall numbers were positive, which is good. We had more revenues or we had less expenditures. And we had, so we had an excess of revenues over expenditures of like 2.4 million. And, but then that, I'm assuming, goes to cover other things. As we as we look forward to going into the current fiscal year that we that we carried over, so I wanted to just make sure that I understood how the how the the variance the positive variance whether that was uh, more or less than we expected <coughs> and how that affected the carryover. Well, actually, page fifty seven I think is the page that you were looking at. Right. Um, the city ended up the year uh, with a deficiency of revenues of 4,500. However, you had budgeted to have a deficiency of 2.4 million. Okay, so you actually did a lot better than you budgeted. Or another way of looking at it, you had planned on using 2.4 million dollars worth of your fund balance, but you only used 4,500 up. Right. So you can say that you ended the year much more positive uh, than you had been anticipated yourself. And, and that's what I took from pages 55, 6, and 7. But then when I went over to page 62, then I wanted to make sure that I understood how that relates to the net change in fund balance at the bottom of that page. Because it that bounces around a fair amount, and for the for the end of 2006, took a net change in the fund balance of close to 300,000 in the negative. And I just I want to make sure I, I understand if if I'm correct in assuming that those are related, how they relate. 
page 62? Yeah, no. I'm okay. You're looking for, looking for something that explains it? Well, it's a modified accrual basis versus the budgetary basis is the answer. Um, but again, let me, uh, I'll work up a, a reconciliation be, between the two numbers for you. Okay. okay. That, that would be helpful. Just, I just want to make sure I understand. Okay. And, and the other, the other thing that I thought was interesting in all of these and nobody has to answer this. This is not a question. This is just an observation. Um, on page 73, um, the, the FTEs for the last 10 years, and, and when you look at uh, where we were in 97 and where we are now, we were at uh, 139 full-time yeah. equivalents, and now we're at 135. I know that... Uh, Part of that had to do with not having as many uh, code enforcement officers when they went to the, when we changed that to the county. But uh, for anybody who's thinking that uh, the Tacoma Park City government is growing, our ma our main uh, our main expenditure is salaries and benefits, and the full time equivalents have gone down. So that. Uh, the increases in uh, funds over 10 years that we've taken in have mainly dealt with uh, either capital or uh, inflation. It isn't that uh, we've got a growing bureaucracy. And, that, and that, I think that's an important trend to know. Councilmember Williams. Um, I just I was looking at something. On the previous question you had, page 62, if you take a look at that, that is all of the governmental funds taken together. All, all of the funds together. Right. Okay. That's not just the general fund, which would be where your budget is, okay. but it also includes your community center funds, special revenue, and non-major funds. And if you look at page 25, you, that's those two numbers, or those two pages are comparable. So when you're looking at 62, that's all governmental activities, not okay. just the general fund. Okay. When you're looking at the budget, the budget is specifically uh, the general fund only. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. That um, and the, and the <coughs> final observation, and I know I've had this observation. Oh, I had one other question. Um, which on page 75, where you look at the... Uh, basically the uh, population by age group. It's very interesting to note the uh, trend over the last 30 plus years that uh, a number of age groups change a little bit, but the big change is the 25 to 44 age group in the city where uh, that age group has doubled. And uh, that really explains a lot, of, a lot of things in terms of what's important to people in the city. So what page are you again? 75. It's uh, basically uh, people who are at the age to be parents. And uh, that should indicate that uh, the numbers of uh, children maybe in the, in the next census will show a continued uh, or a renewed upward trend since they were generally going to be down. Yes, I know. Well, look, look at the drop in everyone over 45, which proves that the boomers are not, in fact, taking what they're doing. Right. Contrary to 
pass away. If I could just back up for a second. The question that I had, and I have it many times, and I just wanted to check on any progress we're making, is on the personal property taxes, business. I think it's page 50. 63. Utility and personal property taxes. And I know that the 2006 fiscal year, the 490, was less than we expected. And I know that we had some troubles for a while with the county collecting those. And I always just have the sense that we're not quite on top of that in terms of making sure that we get what's due. And I didn't know if anybody had any observations on how those collections are. Actually, as a follow-up to prior years, there was a management letter in comment last year about the collection efforts. So we do, we complete a prior follow-up on those issues. And actually, with respects to the personal property taxes, as well as your stormwater and your license and refuge, the finance department has made tremendous strides. They have established procedures for collecting these debts. They, last year, I think it was one taxpayer in particular for, I think it was license and refuge, stormwater, that his one balance was probably maybe 60 percent of the balance. And they were able to collect that during fiscal year 06. Currently, as the finance department is working on trying to refine that collection process, they're also looking at just some of the efforts that they are taking to make sure that there is a value added, as well as allow, let the citizens know that the city does need, do need their money and would like payment for services that are rendered. But the finance department has improved greatly over the past fiscal year. I just had one follow-up question on that, the stormwater fees. You mentioned that was a management note last year? Yes. And one of the things that's troubled me through this year as we've talked about the stormwater fee is why that it wasn't a management note until last year, if those things have been outstanding for so long. Actually, it was a management note a couple of years ago. It wasn't, we didn't, it might not have said stormwater particularly, but it was a collection effort of the city. It has been a previous management note that was made. Okay. Yes. I feel better. Thank you. It's a comment that's come up time and time again, and the comment comes up when things are done to help relieve the situation, progress is made, and it goes on. Then every couple of years it seems to pop up again with changes in, you know, city managers as well as treasurers and things of that nature. I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank Ms. Brooks for the great progress we've made in that area this year. I think a lot of work was put in, and I acknowledge that and appreciate it. Thank you. And maybe I'll take this opportunity to put in another plug for my thought that we should consider at some point publishing lists of people who owe big sums. It's public information, and it might help to collect it. You should also thank the city manager because she spent a lot of time in working with the finance department to improve our collection efforts. I do. And she's come up with some very creative ways of trying to get people to respond. I do thank you, Barb, and I know also that every time I thank her, she always says, well, thank you, Ms. Brooks. I would just mention, since we're talking about the stormwater collections, that Ms. Brooks and I do have a meeting later this week to sort of revisit the issue with the county about possibly putting the city's various fees on the county property tax bills. They have been reluctant to do so in the past, I think just because of how it impacts their workload. They've agreed to meet with us to talk about that further. I would share with the council that we do have sort of a certain core of the community that, for whatever reason, seems resistant to, you know, paying their bills. It is a relatively small fee that we charge for all of these items, and I think one of the things that the county isn't amenable to putting on the property tax bill is you will start seeing us sort of shorten the cycle in terms of how we're doing things, because if you just think about 
what will now be a $48 charge, it doesn't take a whole lot before you start racking up more expense in terms of trying to collect it than it's actually worth. Um, so I think what we've sort of learned, Ms. Brooks and I, as well as her staff, in going through this is that you need to kind of send a second notice at 30 days and truthfully, as harsh as it may sound, move fairly quickly to advising people that the property can be put up for sale. It's certainly not something that we want to do, uh, but I think we have found that in the absence of at least mentioning that that's a possibility, sometimes people don't follow through. I think it's um, interesting that uh, people have used that as a way of making a statement of their frustration of one, one thing or another about the city, and for some reason they, they target the stormwater fee as the way of doing it. Yeah, I think one of the things we're going to do this year, certainly the amount is changing, as the council may recall, for 07. Um, I think there has been some confusion, at least in the past, in terms of that it's not part of your property tax bill. And I think for some individuals, it's just been a legitimately um, you know, misinformation about how that's collected. Um, what we're going to do this year is before the bills go out, as we will do an article in the newsletter, as well as probably send the council some information that maybe you could share on your various listservs, highlighting why the fee is changing and also just denoting that it is not part of the property tax bill and it's the responsibility of each property owner to remit that directly to the city. So hopefully some of that may help alleviate some of the problems we've experienced in the past. Maybe we could figure out if someone's not paying their stormwater fee, we could figure out a way to return to them their stormwater. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Novak, did you want to go over yeah. some management yeah. comments? Yeah, we have one other thing that uh, we need to go over, and I'm going to let uh, Eris Coleman, who is the manager on the job, uh, go over this part. As I say every year, there are a lot of things that you do right. We're not allowed to write down what you do right. We're only allowed to write down what you don't do right or what you could improve upon. Um, our comments are strictly uh, constructive in nature and uh, there to point out areas where the city can improve. And with that, we had two areas this year, and I'll let uh, Eris go over those with you. <coughs> Excuse me. Kai, um, to reiterate what Mr. Uh, Novak said earlier, two years ago I became manager for the financial audit for the city of Tacoma Park. And the, um, over the last few years, the management comments that have made the letter since, uh, I think, 2004, have been more of a constructive nature, um, something that I, I think you're able to, this, the finance department as well as the city manager are able to take that to build upon and make um, changes even beyond some of our recommendations. Um, and saying that, one of the two items we have today um, is kind of the Archer's pet peeve, the segregation of duties um, in the recreation department. Um, as we know, while the community center was being built, a lot of departments were housed in different places. Um, recreation was housed in a trailer that is no longer out in the parking lot. Um, and the director of recreation, um, in a way of trying to keep the customers from having to go in and out of the building, sometimes in bad weather, um, had, had started, started to collect the program fees um, herself me and herself, her staff. Um, the, the problem with that was that it's only two main persons who are involved in that process. And one person actually is doing the registration when a um, customer comes in and wants to take a class or an activity. This person is doing the registration as well as this person is, is accepting the fee for the particular program. Um, and saying that probably maybe 80% or more of the fees were in checks, which of course for less risk than cash. Um, <clears throat> each day, the particular individual would, do, would register the, uh, the customer into the program with, uh, using um, the registration program that the city has established. They would just print out the cash that was received or uh, payments that were received were um, with accompany, accompany this printout. The concern we, we have or the concern we noted is that sometimes the director or the, the other person in the uh, department would be, would be there to be able to compare what was registered, the fees that were charged, and what was collected. Well, because the, uh, the other individual was director, she had other obligations, and sometimes she was not there to perform this verification. 
and therefore you had one person doing the registration, collecting payment, and then we also remitting the payment to the finance department, where a second check was done in the finance department, but still you had one person having total control of the process. Um, <clears throat> this was an area that just through uh, our normal question and answer session we do during the year with various uh, department heads and staff members, it was um, we identified this particular risk and discussed this with the uh, uh, Parks and Rec Director, as well as the City Manager and the Director of Finance. <clears throat> Excuse me. In doing that, the City has prepared a response to our uh, concerns as well as our recommendation, which is noted on the management letter. And since then, uh, since we have uh, brought this issue up, the City, as well as Director of uh, Program of Recreation, has instituted additional procedures to ensure that there is another independent verification of registrants as well as the um, <clears throat> payments that are going to accompany the, uh, the registration for that day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's... Can, can, yes. I, just, can I just clarify um, in terms of your, your uh, comments? Um, when you looked at this, did you um, uncover any evidence that money had been improperly accounted for, or is this more in the nature of a concern that this could lead to a problem in the future? Yes, yes correct. What we do as part of our audit and planning, we call their um, SAS 99, call them fraud questions. It's just a name. Um, and we ask a series of questions, and just we kind of get out of the box of the normal audit questions. And in, in doing this, we learned of this concern that cash is being collected outside of the finance department um, by a, the, the part by the, pro, the recreation department. From there, that led us to speak to the recreation director. From there, we spoke to the individual who uh, does the registration. We looked at, uh, we did. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, from that point, we uh, have had to report some trans cash transactions, can match them up with uh, various registrants as well as the payments, and we did not find any evidence of any fraudulent activity or misappropriation of funds. Um, it's just, it just is in a management letter as a concern because going forward and left unchecked, um, as officers always say, fraud is generally committed because you have the opportunity. I appreciate that clarification. Sure. Thank you. Terry? Uh, thank you. The, uh, I really appreciate your looking at this issue because it is something that, uh, that has come up, up, up in the past. And I just wonder, you mentioned uh, the collection of the fees here at the Recreation Department, but we also have a facility over on New Hampshire Avenue, and it, historically we have had a problem prior to Ms. Matthews coming uh, mm -hmm. with the city. There was a problem with uh, registration fees right. uh, at the New Hampshire Rec facility, and I just wondered if uh, that is encompassed in the safeguards that are implemented here. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second, um, I, oh, I'm sorry. I think there's one more oh, question. Sorry. <laughs> um, before I came here, I worked in a city in a recreation department that should remain nameless. Where <laughs> They had exactly that problem, and there were there were tens of thousands of dollars in safes and bank accounts related to various divisions of the recreation department, which ultimately led to the termination and newspaper headlines of, of several staff members. And I, I would agree that it was kind of a crime of, of opportunity. Um, and um, I observed this going on when I first got there. I can probably tell you at least 20 different ways to cheat the system. But um, one of the fixes that came out of this was that they went to uh, online registration. And I've had a lot of people ask me about online registration for the recreation department. It's, it's, uh, it's convenient for people. You register with a credit card and people can still come in person. And usually what, what happened, at least in the instance of this city, was the, the person behind the desk would take the cash or the, or the check and do the registration and give them a uh, a printout from the system and and that pretty much stops all of that because the money doesn't go into the 
safe in the floor under the administrative assistance desk, but instead goes um, it goes right into the to the bank account for the for the city. And I was, I was wondering if there's any possibility of, of uh, pursuing online registration. Either I, I imagine our own system would probably be pretty expensive, but I wonder if we could catch a ride on um, another city or county's. Uh, registration system. Well, actually, I do believe um, <clears throat> it, it is something I take because of the cost that I guess the city would definitely have to take into consideration. Um, when, one thing, when you're looking at these comments, um, you have to take a look at the cost and the benefit. If the cost outweighs the benefit of doing something, then it's not necessarily uh, the best thing to do. While online registration would help to resolve the issue, um, it would resolve the issue for those individuals who could use credit card, for instance. Um, however, for those individuals who either couldn't or chose not to, uh, you would have to have another avenue uh, for them to register, which would lead us right back to where we are right now. So while it probably would be helpful uh, in curtailing most uh, most you would still have a certain, uh, at least in our, in our experience, there would be a certain level of individual um, that would still want to, you know, come up and, you know, register in person and pay in person. So you would be back to the same issue. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> and the last item that we have. Uh, deals with their rehabilitation loans that the city issued um, many years ago. With these loans, the city has two sets. One set of the loans uh, were issued for individuals who wanted to do rehabilitation to their house. They were federally <clears throat> backed loans, and the individual would not had the choice of not paying the loan, but the, the deed the loan was um, recorded in the deed of the individual's home. So if the home was ever sold, the city would collect their money. Then you have the um, another set which were being repaid and have been repaid on time. Um, I think right now the outstanding balance as of 06 was maybe 30 something thousand dollars that was due um, for those loans that had to be repaid. Of the ones that, um, the ones that we're speaking about here are the ones that we call deferred. They did not have to be repaid. Um, the city, uh, the loan was, was supposed to be recorded on the individual's deed. Therefore, the city will recoup their money if, if and when the home was, uh, was sold. When, um, and look at these loans, they were issued more than 20 years ago. And over, through the years, periodically, um, as, since we have been auditors, we will look at the loan files to make sure, one, that you, the loan paper, the, the paperwork was, still um, was intact, it was adequate. The, uh, we had proof of the deed being recorded onto the owner's uh, <clears throat> deed. And we, due to the low risk of these loans, every year we may, not, we may not select them to actually pull the files. We may do this analytical, just make sure nothing's changed, or something's changed. We, may look, we will look further into that. Well, this year was one of the years where we opted to actually pull files. Um, and in pulling the files, we uh, noted the issues that we have here, where one loan file, the loan I think was $1,500, we could not locate the loan file. Um, no, I'm sorry, that was, the wrong, that was the other one. I'm sorry. The one that the loan file we could not locate was, um, I think, $42,000. However, the individual, we sent confirmations of the receivable. The individual did sign the uh, confirmation stating that the money was due to the city. The problem is, sorry, oh. <laughs> um, the only concern with that is that you do, you do not have proof of recorded deed. So I can sign a letter and say, oh, until you try to collect it, um, that's the concern there. The second um, item was we were able to find paperwork of the loan agreement, the promise right now, however, we could not find proof of the deed being recorded on the individual's um, homeowner's deed. And that loan there was, I think, $1,500. So in going forward, we, uh, in, in talking, uh, bringing this matter to uh, Yvonne Brooks, there was a, a, a bad debt allowed me adjustment expense placed to the, <clears throat> for the rehabilitation loans for 
fiscal year 06 with um, additional uh, research and just review of the outstanding loans to determine collectability of the loans going forward to see if any additional allowance or uh, bad debt expense needs to be recorded uh, in fiscal year 07 and going forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this is this is a record a record keeping issue. Yes, and I, yeah, chances chances are <clears throat> uh, since we had looked at these in the past and we had found documents in place with <clears throat> all the movement of documents and things of that nature that occurred in the past couple of years <clears throat> with the uh, construction going on here in the community center. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's yeah. It's very possible that uh, you know that a file has been misplaced. Um, so you know the fact that the individual has indicated that they are aware they owe the money uh, is a good sign. Um, basically, I think what what needs to be done is, is take a look into the deed to see that in fact um, a loan is still uh, recorded on that on that individual's deed and. I think if you have documentation of that, you'll be in good shape. Does this but then I'm not a lawyer, so I'm giving legal advice. Does this suggest, though, that uh, there may be other collectibles lying out there in the files and, and that maybe it would be a good idea to do some additional pulling just for our own? Well, we, we have pulled all the files. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, and these were the only two uh, exceptions that we found when we pulled the files. Okay. Um, it's probably not a bad idea every once in a while to pull the files to make sure. Uh, also, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to contact the counties to make sure they're aware of these loans in existence, that if the properties are conveyed, uh, they make sure that it doesn't slip through the cracks. Okay. That, do you want to add something? No, I just wanted to, if we're wrapping up, did you have anything else, Mr. Novak? Or, yeah, before we end it, I just wanted to um, thank everyone at Clifton Dennis, and particularly Ms. Mr. Novak and Ms. Coleman for all their assistance, and um, certainly Ms. Brooks and her staff. Uh, it, it's a true pleasure to be sitting up here tonight and have a vastly different situation than I guess I uh, inherited when I first started, and I cer certainly think... Uh, the vast majority of the credit goes to Ms. Brooks and the excellent work that she's done as well as that of her staff. Okay, well, you I, a much better feeling. And I, I do want to echo that and thank you for the work you do and also thank also the city manager and the finance director for doing an excellent and their staffs for doing an excellent job and we very much appreciate it and I think it's really made a noticeable difference. Thank you all. One, I'm sorry. I know we're trying to wrap this up and the only thing I want to make sure of is that as we go forward, I know you've um, been the firm that we've used for our audits for several years now. Are there things on an ongoing basis that you do to maintain your independence of the city, um, reporting any conflicts of interest? Uh, you know, do you do the forms or something annually? Well, <coughs> we don't do forms annually. However, we are bound by both generally accepted audit standards and governmental auditing standards um, to ensure that we maintain our independence by not uh, getting involved in any transactions with the city, by not um, discussing matters with management prior to our retention as auditors, um, and basically maintaining a independence not only in fact but also in appearance as well. Um, basically the only time you see us in the city is at audit time. Uh, the rest of the time, we basically uh, don't get involved in any way, shape, or form with the city. Good. And so really, it boils down to you get paid for contracted services regardless of whether you find problems or not. That's correct. And your credibility as a firm is based on you finding problems when they exist. That's correct. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I also appreciate your work. And I, um, since you've been with, uh, you know, the city, um, the firm that we've retained for several years, um, it's it's great if that can continue, but I do think that independence is critical, and I'm glad that you're well aware of how to maintain that. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. The council is going to take a very short break and come back to the final item for my agenda.
Okay, You're, you are going to give us an update. Um, I believe the last time we talked to you, you had a number of things underway but not completed, and I assume that you're going to talk to us about a number of things that have been completed since then. Yes, uh, I'm Stacy Baker, and I'm the co-chair of the Emergency Preparedness Committee. The other co-chair is Deputy City Manager Wayne Hobbs, who's also here tonight and who's uh, reviewed the report that I'm going to give you. I would like to begin with an update on progress uh, on the recommendations that we had provided from our committee the last time that I was here in April. And I have circulated a one-page report that goes with my report tonight and a one-page attachment where you can see our work plans in the past six months and uh, where we are on all of those items for additional detail. When I was here in April, we had completed a major task, which was to uh, review as a committee, which is comprised of staff and uh, citizens uh, from Tacoma Park and representatives of, of Montgomery County. We had com completed a review of the city's uh, emergency operations plan. And at that time, we had recommended that uh, it is adequate, but it certainly needed major uh, improvements. It was written before September 11th of 2001. A lot had changed. The understanding of the role of the city relative to the county, uh, incident command structures were not in place at that time. So there were many opportunities for that plan to be strengthened. So our first recommendation was that uh, the city plan be updated. And uh, since then, the staff have completed a schedule that is feasible to both update the plan and ensure that staff are trained in the National Incident Management System, uh, which would enable them to carry out emergency functions um, in the, under the authority of the county, to transfer authority in emergencies to the county, et cetera. So that's a very positive thing that there is now a plan uh, underway to update that plan. Um, and the staff had reported that the expertise from the committee and the process of focusing on it uh, was very helpful in that regard. We have formed subcommittees to focus on some of the more problematic, uh, problematic areas of the plan. Uh, the first one that we have folks working on is uh, the issue of how to communicate between the city and the residents in the event of an emergency where people are not signed up for alert to coma, they can't receive a message from email or on their cell phone, um, and they may not be listening to um, radio or mass media, uh, how do we get word to them? Uh, originally in the plan there were three major elements, uh, all of which had a flaw. One was to rely on public safety contacts as a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor kind of communication of involving uh, civilians. Another was to use kiosks around the city, which was uh, an untested and unpromoted mechanism of getting the word out by notices, you know, possibly worthwhile but not ready to function uh, at the time we reviewed the plan. And then the third was uh, having uh, police have uh, loudspeakers on their cars uh, going around, which can be a problem because those vehicles may be needed for other purposes <laughs> in an emergency. So realizing that it was complex, uh, that is an example of one thing where we formed a subcommittee to really work with um, public safety, so acting uh, Chief Corsi has been involved, members of our committee, city staff, in looking at you know what would be more appropriate and, and feasible ways to go forward. And we're going to be looking at that and voting on some recommendations uh, this week. So I don't have those for you, but I wanted to give you an example of a way that our committee has been involved in updating the plan. The second recommendation that we had was that given that the plan called for a whole lot of community outreach and communications and things that didn't really fit with staff day-to-day -day responsibility that either the expectations of the city's preparedness roles needed to be reduced uh, or personnel assignments needed to be shifted or increased to somehow make an alignment between what's in the plan and what can be done. Yeah, August 1st, uh, there was an opportunity that city staff saw to uh, shift some assignments, so there's a half full-time equivalent person, uh, Vanita George, who is now assigned to help coordinate some of the city preparedness efforts. So that is a, a major milestone that our committee wanted to bring to your attention that increases the, the capacity of the, the staff that work for the city um, to carry out preparedness responsibilities. 
Uh, we also recommended that um, the council might choose to set a deadline for staff to be trained on the National Incident Management System, as well as uh, assuring that uh, the plans conform to NIMS. So we're working on uh, the plan, or the city is working on the plan being updated, but they've made very good tar uh, progress on their target, uh, which was October 1, which we still thought was very aggressive as a target date for 100% of staff participating in two different trainings that are offered free by FEMA. Um, and so you can see on this sheet that, uh, you know, at least 76% have completed these courses. So um, not hitting the target date, but, you know, very impressive progress and, and well underway. Um, similarly, staff recommended that the Emergency Preparedness Committee, if we were to make such recommendations, that we should also have such training. So we set a target that all of our committee members would submit um, certificates of completions of these courses by the end of November. So that we will measure at the end of this week, I guess, to see how we've, how we've met on that. Um, lastly, and this is probably what everyone uh, always re recommends to council, that ensuring, ensuring appropriate resources uh, for preparedness. And since your uh, approval of a budget that included $20,000 for supplies, although those um, supplies have not yet been procured, that also really helps to increase the city's capacity to purchase what's needed in order to fulfill an obligation to shelter staff, to shelter recreation patrons, to shelter any, any kind of patron that might be um, in a city building. Uh, so those are meant for, as I understand it, pots, food, water, uh, those kinds of supplies. Uh, and so the staff have been queried uh, by deputy city manager for other supplies needs that they might have um, in addition. So those are some updates on our past recommendations. Our committee has uh, talked at a few points about what else we would like to update you on. And so in no particular order, um, I have these listed. We're very pleased that we have been able to turn our attention to some outreach um, and that we made 100% of, of the summer and fall festivals in having a booth thanks to Montgomery County. So we saw a role as not um, doing that independently, but coordinating with Montgomery County, who already have materials, giveaways, uh, all of the you know county, state, and federal materials that you could want on emergency preparedness. Um, they brought all of the uh, the tables that we needed. The fire department participated. So that, those were very well received outreach opportunities where people were glad to see that there was a Tacoma Park emergency preparedness focus, um, and we estimate, or the county estimates, um, through their materials based on formula distribution that we reached about 1,250 people. Not all of which we can guarantee are Tacoma Park residents, uh, but nonetheless a good outreach event. Uh, we also coordinated with the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee that paid for uh, the printing, I understand, for the preparedness fire, the bilingual English and Spanish preparedness fire that went out with the newsletter. So that was a positive um, outreach um, activity. On pandemic or um, avian influenza preparedness, we've recommended that those uh, planning activities get bumped up in the list for supplies acquisition and for other um, uh, preparedness activities for the city. Um, and I've I itemized here several of the things that, that have happened um, that have been reported through our committee as we've tried to uh, keep tabs on the progress here. The city workers have received their flu shots, um, contracted to the Washington Adventist Hospital. Uh, there was to be a joint presentation from the county health department on pandemic flu and government uh, response planning to the committee and the staff. Um, however, because of scheduling conflicts, uh, we couldn't get one on the dates that the committee is scheduled to meet, but the staff are going to be receiving a presentation in December on their roles and response in pandemic flu. And we will try to also schedule um, some programming for the committee so we can stay on top of that, uh, that issue. The committee itself has facilitated some additional communication coordination around pandemic flu planning. For example, um, discussion of what are the recommendations for public safety having the appropriate masks their fit testing. And so some of the connections that occur within the committee itself have sped up 
um, some, some of that um, arrangement happening. Um, the next county exercise, so for most exercising, Tacoma Park is participating under the organization of the county. The next one in December is on pandemic flu. So there's some things happening that are, are helpful in um, pandemic flu preparedness. Our most important concern in the city is that the city is an employer, if, you know, first. Secondly, the city provides services that are very important, protecting the, the safety and the health of residents. So if 30 to 50 percent of the workforce doesn't show up, how does trash get collected? How do, you know, police do their job to protect public safety? Um, and then the third role is in support of other jurisdictions who may need um, to call on city staff, public safety personnel to support efforts that they need. Um, so this is still a really important issue. Um, it may be out of some of the headlines, but it hasn't gone away. Uh, alert Tacoma, call to your attention that uh, from what Chief Cor uh, Acting Chief Corsi knows, our registration is on par with other jurisdictions. Uh, but it's still very low. So you can see here that you know we're under the under 400 people, and in a community of our size, um, the promise of using a system like this for broad alerting it, is not something that we have achieved yet. So I'm hoping as our committee looks to our deliverable list for the next six months, that that this may be on it in finding some ways to really maximize the potential uh, of this system, which is a, a good part of our infrastructure. Uh, I understand that through the Council of Governments, our region will get the reverse 911 service by the end of the year. If that, if that indeed happens, that is one of the most major advances in our ability to communicate with residents. Large numbers of people rapidly in an emergency with a message, um, with information about what to do, where to tune in, <laughs> um, you know, provided that phone lines are working. Um, so again, for the next report, I hope that uh, we can say more about that because that will impact uh, the plans for the city. How would Tacoma Park uh, avail itself of using that type of service? Uh, I, I certainly don't know, you know the answers to that, uh, but that's something that I think our committee will, will look into as that uh, becomes available. Uh, some council members had also asked about um, exercises, so I wanted to point out that um, we did experience uh, one missed opportunity this summer in which our, our city missed the opportunity to participate in uh, a Montgomery County exercise about a train derailment, which is a, an issue that's a particular concern here in Tacoma Park um, because of a communication problem. But now that's sorted out that they know the right people to tell, <laughs> from what I understand. And it means staff uh, plan to participate in 100% of the, the county-led exercises. Um, and that our current schedule, um, the current schedule for modifying the plan calls for exercising the revised city plans after they are changed. You know, it doesn't make sense to exercise a part of a plan that you don't think is going to work. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, uh, we had previously, before my last report, made as a committee some recommendations uh, for the change in the purpose for the committee, some language changes, uh, things such as where it said that we would establish relations with the county to change it, that we thought it would be better stated that we would advise the city and the, on ways to more effectively relate to the county, that we were a committee, not a government-to-government -government relation entity, things that, uh, like, instead of um, promoting or, or offering search training for people that want to be part of the community emergency response team, that we would coordinate with the county for that because they do that, things like that. And it just slipped through the cracks in getting to you. So we'll make sure that the council get the suggested changes for your consideration. Well, the, the timing on that is, is actually very good because we are now going through a process of talking to a number of committees and we will be making changes in some of the committees. Uh, statutory Great. charter so this your timing is fine good that's one one for the team that slipping through the cracks didn't cause a problem but was good good timing um, some of, some of our challenges uh, we have suffered uh, some 
losses of membership, uh, which is not uncommon to committees, I'm sure. Uh, we have, I believe, three vacancies now, and we really need people um, that represent the racial and ethnic diversity of our community. We need people that represent um, different wards. And we really care very much that we have people that represent apartment dwellers and not just people who are um, homeowners or live in single family homes. So that, that, those are some of the things that are really important to our committee as we think about the preparedness needs um, of the city. Uh, and the second challenge that I would note for you is, is always the case of competing staff priorities. We're getting a little bit behind schedule, I fear, for updating the emergency operations plan. Uh, we probably won't make a, a draft by December 1 to the committee, and then committee comments were going to be due in February. But I think we can still pull it out, and Wayne Hobbs is, is confident that we can still get this done by the April 2007 deadline. There are excellent relationships between the staff and the um, resident members of the committee, and we'll work together to keep this moving ahead rather than let it slide, because it, it's too important. Um, a few other items that uh, I want to thank Council Members uh, Siemens and uh, Austin Lane for providing some questions in advance. Uh, so there are a few other items that I wanted to address because of their uh, questions. One question is about uh, the role of the neighborhood safety contacts and uh, their role in communicating. And I'd mentioned earlier that, that our subcommittee was reviewing the, the non-electronic communications plan. Um, however, we've, we've also uh, asked our representative, uh, Buddy Daniels, from the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee to please report to us at the end of this six-month work period, what is the coverage of public safety contacts in Tacoma Park who have an acknowledged emergency communications role They've agreed to it, and we could call them up, you know, tomorrow if needed. And, and there are no, there is no roster of, of contacts who have an agreed role, who've been trained to do something, um, and, and who are, you know, in, engaged in any system that we could use. And even if there were, um, there are concerns about any civilians, their safety, and delivering a consistent message. So I expect later this week that our committee will recommend uh, removing public safety contacts after they've been in the plan for five years, you know, removing them because the system currently doesn't exist to mobilize them for a productive purpose. And, and that's kind of being replaced with the CERT program? Um, yes, kind of being replaced with that. So the Montgomery County coordinates CERTs. So if we have a uh, an emergency in Tacoma Park that is so large that um, even the sizable Montgomery County professional staff cannot, is not enough to come to aid and get the word out to residents or whatever is needed. Um, they have an additional asset, which is to mobilize this trained core, or somewhat trained, I'm one of them, we're not that well trained, but <laughs> trained core of volunteers, the CERTs. And so we have, um, we have that as an asset that we could request Montgomery County to call them up and, and play that kind of paraprofessional emergency responder role. To increase the chance that um, we will have more certs that are quick, uh, quickly able to respond on the scene in Tacoma Park, we focused on promoting cert. Our goal this past six months was to double our certs from four to eight, and we're at ten. As a result of some really hard promotion, including Buddy Daniels and uh, getting the word out about it, uh, we were able to also locate um, a cert training in November here at the community center. So we're making some progress in that regard as a citizen replacement. Uh, but there may still be uh, other uses in the future for citizens in emergency circumstances, but at this time we don't want anything in the plan. I certainly don't want anything in the plan that is um, not ready to be mobilized. Can I ask about that yeah. um, CERT training? Yes. Is it something that you have, uh, I mean, probably the neighborhood safety contacts list was one where you um, 
so those people is likely to register for cert. Yes. And so, so you've done the recruiting from that list. Yeah. I just want to make sure that if those folks who I, um, I, I did a fair amount of recruiting in my early days on the city council to mm -hmm. get more of those from Ward 1, and they, they really did want the training and they wanted to know what their role was, and a lot of that was unclear. So I'm glad there's more structure to it now that they can plug into, and I hope that you'll um, generate, you know, interest by having ten people, see if those ten people can find, you know, two people each that will sign up. That's um, a step in the right direction to keep doubling that every year. And um, mm -hmm. I appreciate that you have these deliverables. It's very concrete and uh, gives us an idea of what you're using to measure your progress and what you're aiming for, and um, I, I like it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wish that we could do better on having a performance dashboard with more measurables about preparedness. Uh, but as, as I shared with, with you uh, previously, it's indicative of the entire emergency preparedness field in my experience that um, there aren't a lot of measures that, you know, I ask people, well, what are the benchmarks? You know, what should we be hoping to achieve for, you know, a registration for a system like Alert Tacoma? What should we um, be able to achieve for home preparedness, and it's tough to provide measures. The, uh, for example, for home preparedness, the Council of Governments has a regional target for our, our area of 50% of homes will have an emergency preparedness kit, and they'll do, they invest in telephone surveys, but, and we know we're at 40%, but we can't single out Tacoma Park. You know, that would require an investment in oversampling that, you know, is not really, you know, realistic for us. So it's hard to know how are we doing as in a result for outreach for a community like Tacoma Park. So if you have additional uh, measures that you'd like to see that helps you govern to know how are we doing on preparedness, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to try to deliver on them for, for you. So, you know, please let us know. Go ahead. I want to know when I get my bullhorn, my radio, and my orange vest. Can I take a cert training? I did 60 days at FEMA. I think that's worth something. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, do we have a website on emergency preparedness in the city that's easy to access and that provides people with the information like what they should have in their house and in their car? To my knowledge, um, the city website points to other websites with that information. One of the things that's really important, not just from an economizing of resources standpoint, but is to not add to confusion. And so it would not be to benefit in, in our estimation for the city to do additional work in creating its own website. Um, we think referring to the county uh, what, that already has a website that includes uh, resources from FEMA and other reputable sources is the way to go. Um, I think one of the things that keeps people from signing up for the Alert Tacoma is that they don't want to sign up to yet another message board where someone's mm -hmm. going to accidentally send them a notice about their kid's latest fundraising project mm -hmm. or, um, or that kind of thing. And, and I think one of the things that would be helpful maybe would be um, to do a little bit of outreach um, on our existing heavily used websites around the mm -hmm. city because we, we have a lot of lists that are around the city. I'm on like six of them and I know that there's three more at least that I'm not on in, in Joy's Ward and, um, and there's a lot of overlap but there's, there's quite a few websites and there are a few people who have actually been talking about Alert Tacoma and what it is and what it isn't recently. Mm. Um, because there's some issue around the police radio calls. But um, but there's been some conversation about it, and people clearly don't really know what it is or what it can do, because we talked about whether or not we could use it to notify people about the change in the trash schedule. I mean, so there's, there's, there's kind of, there's not really, I think, a great understanding of even the people who I would say are your superpower users of internet listservs. So, 
a um, little more outreach maybe around that would help, and I, I could help you identify who those are. If you could make a list, I think probably most, between most of the people mm -hmm. in the council, we're probably connected into almost every listserv that there is. And the other thing is Thank that, you. Sure. Before, before you even mentioned that some of the other council members talked about community contacts, I was thinking, wow, you know, neighborhood block captains. And then mm -hmm. you went on to express why you wouldn't include them in the plan. And um, my, my, my field of expertise is actually uh, community development and community building. And building community at the block level is one of the, I think, most important things that you can do to get people involved in, in what's going on. So I would argue that we should retain um, our connection with the, the public safety contacts, and even if you don't, even if you don't use them in in your in your plan that you put together, um, as if they were some critical underpinning of the of the whole process, um, those folks have a lot of really useful information. And and one example would be if we had block captains across the city, they might know where the the homebound disabled folks are that are on their specific street. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was a kid, I had a brother that had cerebral palsy, and and, and we had a, a sticker, the, one of those big handicap signs, right on our door and then on his window, so the firemen knew like there's a, there's a handicapped person here, and then if they were on the outside, they could find it at, at the window, which is a good thing. I don't see those anymore, but but I know I know the lady who lives across the street from me is in a wheelchair. And she has a ramp, she, and she couldn't get out of her house if there was a gas emergency or, or, or something like that. And I hear from the people in Long Branch, Sligo, I watch them on the listserv and how they're watching out, well, this person, you know, have you mm -hmm. connected up with this person who has this particular issue? And I, I think that's kind of the critical thing is, is they know all of the, the little details. And so it would be good to know as an emergency responder if you just had a list of people and their addresses that you could maybe go to in a community if you had specific questions about something that was happening in that area, even if it wasn't who you were relying on to stand at the corner with the bullhorn and the orange vest. So I take away from what, what you're suggesting, that, that we should be mindful of there are formal channels and then there are like in, informal channels that we should seek to strengthen. And certainly your points about um, people in the neighborhood, uh, people who are patrollers, people who are involved in public safety contacts who have other types of community responsibilities, they can be on the front lines of making sure that certain neighbors that have special needs are attended to. That's so one of the that. suggestions of the many suggestions that are going to come out of this meeting on Thursday, and you're echoing exactly what uh, a rescue fireman who was teaching mm -hmm. the last CERT class. I went, uh, since I coordinated the last CERT class, I went through it again and really enjoyed it. And one of his comments was, when rescue gets into a neighborhood after a catastrophe of some kind, we used a tornado, if we really need people to come to our assistance to identify the houses to identify where there may be uh, citizens with certain problems because that neighborhood may have drastically changed in a worst case scenario. And I thought, wow, what a what place to use uh, safety contacts. It's just a possibility. We will be uh, putting, uh, throwing out some ideas on Thursday and even some of the other meetings and seeing what the committee uh, proposes. I, for one, am very much in favor of what you've just suggested. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. But that's going to be one of my proposals, one of the committee's proposals um, for the safety contacts to be, and they are familiar with the neighborhood. And in an emergency situation, once help has arrived, assist uh, the rescuers in uh, rescuing and assisting uh, people who may be in trouble. Thanks. Hopefully, we never have to be in that situation, but. I want to plan for the worst case scenario. So, so if I'm understanding your suggestion, your suggestion is that we um, maintain our, um, our system of uh, public safety contacts, but that we not necessarily rely on them as a primary means of communication because of the gaps that you mentioned. But it sounds, Buddy, from what you're saying, that, that we are going to try and continue to use them for public information and other kinds of purposes. And presumably, if we could build a, a more comprehensive system, then they might be useful for the purposes that you were talking about, Stacey, well, right? Possibly. 
So, I mean, I think that we just need to have a, a, a line You're between what is the formal use yeah. and what are informal channels. Certainly, you know, we did a presentation of the public safety contacts about you can become involved in CERT. You, because you are involved in public safety and are concerned, can be a source of information and inspiration to your neighbors to get their emergency kits. You know, so, so there can be the cheerleading for the um, informally. Um, and, and in trying to work those networks, and then there comes to be there's the city responsibility to respond in a certain way uh, under a chain of command, or, you know, with the county. And I don't feel that the public safety con context can be part of that. To well, do, to okay, kind of I appreciate that, that assessment. I, I do. Coming back to the cheerleading comment and the thing that I said about the community development and community building is, I think that they're they're critical in the preparedness portion of it and not necessarily in the response yes. portion. Yes, exactly. that's the way to, right. Thank you for articulating it that way. Well, it didn't occur to me until you said the cheerleading thing, but mm -hmm. but that's what it is. They and I don't mean to demean it by saying cheerleading. No, I didn't think so. Community uh, building cheerleading, I think yeah. you're talking about the same thing. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> right. I, actually, I think you are. Right. Yeah, but, but that's exactly what it is. Those are the folks who are doing the community building portions of it and can help you with the preparedness message can help you get people to sign on to the mm -hmm. to the listserv, but and I think that's where they're 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 critical. And I can guarantee you that if we don't have them, or if we take if we take all roles away from them because we don't have a, a formal official role for them, that we will diminish our capacity to do that portion of the preparedness that they do so well. And it'll have a negative impact on I think the other kinds of community building things that they do that that are, are adjacent to the emergency preparedness activities. Well, okay. well, to wrap up. Well, you're echoing exactly what uh, we're going to be proposing, uh, just to propose to the committee on uh, Thursday. And keep in mind that the public safety contacts are very much still, whatever happens, a liaison between the community and certainly our police department. That's where they were developed to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, you know, we'll, you know, we'll be defining, you know, we'll, we'll discuss it on Thursday, and like I said, you are echoing exactly what the Non-Electronic Communications Committee uh, may very well be proposing. We're still talking about it before we propose it, but I'm in agreement, full agreement with what you just said. So. Okay. Um. I'm done. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, I, just the take-home messages is that we're, we're still operating under a plan that needs improvement. Um, there's a plan in place to improve the city's emergency preparedness plan. Um, there are increased uh, resources in terms of human capacity, uh, being well-trained, having a half FTE uh, that helped the city be better prepared than we were six months ago when I was here. Um, there's also an increased level of uh, priority and commitment that, um, uh, that we as citizen members detect through the staff. Um, that this is a really important area to be working on um, for the city's preparedness. Uh, and lastly, there's a much improved relationship, I believe, from six months ago uh, with the county and cooperation in delivering the outreach and clarifying roles. Uh, it continues to be a very productive um, relationship. Um, we would welcome very much your feedback on how, how is this committee doing? for your performance expectations. What are the things that you would like to see us work on uh, for the next six months as we prepare our set of deliverables for January through June? Um, and how can we better you know, carry out work uh, on your behalf and work with, work with you? Well, I, I want to say that I very much appreciate this report. And I very much appreciate not only the expertise that you and your committee obviously have, but your great organizational ability. That helps with a very large task like this. Um, actually, you covered everything that I had on my list of questions. I have one more that actually is probably more addressed to the city than to the committee. Um, I don't know whether I should address this to the city manager, the assistant city manager, but you mentioned that the uh, $20,000 for supplies has yet to be expended, and you also recommended that the um, influenza-related supplies be high on that list of supplies purchased. I wonder where that stands currently. Do we have plans to purchase that, uh, those supplies, and would they also I, – I would agree with you that uh, giving priority to the, the pandemic flu-related 
things would be probably a good idea. What little I know about this area. We're trying to identify what we can get from the county because they have gotten grants for some of the things, like the, the masks that have to be worn by the mm -hmm. police officers and whatnot. Once we've done that, then we'll put together the other things we need, and the staff feeds it to me. I would guess soon after the first of the year we'll have some kind of start purchasing stuff that we need. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I, I always appreciate your um, interest in um, not expending money that we don't have to. Um, but I do think we should move forward on this because, you know, the flu season um, is upon us already. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Barry? Thank you. Uh, first, I just uh, really appreciate the uh, report. You're presenting the report. It's very well organized and it's uh, very helpful in seeing, uh, you know, what you hope to accomplish and, and how you're doing against those goals. Uh, I look forward to, you know, what would I like to see? I think you've identified a whole lot of things to work on uh, for the coming six months. I don't uh, think of anything right offhand that, you know, I want to add to this, but I certainly would like to see your uh, your goals and your, your calendar uh, in okay. the near term so that we can then see mm -hmm. where you are uh, six months from now when you come back or three months from now, I'm not sure. We still, we're, we've talked about maybe having quarterly reports from uh, very active committees such as yours. Uh, you know, several topics came up tonight that I really wasn't expecting to talk about, but I just wanted to mention because of the you know, flow of consciousness here. Uh, uh, Council Member Clay had mentioned uh, window stickers, and I wonder if that isn't something that uh, that we could use in. Uh, in lieu of neighborhood contacts, uh, and it's something maybe the fire department, I know they in the past have done that uh, with window stickers for the uh, uh, children's rooms, as you said, uh, or different, uh, different mm -hmm. things. Um, and that might be something that uh, uh, I would like to voice support for. The, you can ask uh, our fire department contact about that. You mean the kind of uh, window stickers that are used for uh, those pets to be rescued here? Why not use them for people that also have a Well, they used to use those for people. Uh, our, our house still has a window Undoubt sticker for, for, for uh, to say there's uh, children in this room. Mm. You know, it's no longer a program. The, the sticker is half gone. But, uh, uh -huh. but it was a program that was in place uh, when we had kids living in the or, or, okay. or, uh, 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 animals in the house, please say them. Right. along that same idea. That, same idea. That's or idea. there's an invalid in this in this particular room, so it identifies uh, you know the window of the room where there's uh, okay. specific attention needed, and it's the same concept that might be used uh, for the example that uh, Councilmember Clay mentioned with a uh, disabled person in the house that would need special attention during. Uh, an emergency, uh, such as someone on a dialysis machine or something that required uh, ongoing power, and, uh, even when you know there is a power outage. So, thank you. Anyway, it's just a just a uh, another suggestion to throw in the hat as you talk about that next week. Uh, on the alert to coma, I was just going to comment again. I, I uh, appreciated what Councilmember Clay was saying. I I think one of the hesitancies that some people have in getting on. Uh, List serves like that is the transaction volume that they might get, uh, mm -hmm. and so you know wherever you're advertising, it's probably important to give them a feel that it's a very limited uh, amount of information that's coming across. That I think the uh, the people who organize and monitor that do very well at at keeping the discussion over on the alert discussion list uh, and using the, uh, the alert list itself just for alerts, things that are uh, ongoing incidents that need special attention. Okay. But I think um, when people, when I think about signing up for listserv, I always worry about how many messages am I going to get, and I'm real reluctant to get on unless I have a comfort level with the transaction volume, so that I think that should be part of any advertisement. Okay. Um, you mentioned membership. One of the issues, and I don't know, I may have mentioned this in my email to you, but one of the, uh, the issues that has come up to me uh, several times is the, uh, your meeting schedule. And I know that uh, you were meeting during the daytimes, mm -hmm. uh, during weekday daytimes. 
which is advantageous to staff members and county employees, but not so advantageous to attracting community members to participate in the committee. And as this committee started out, at least, to be an advisory, a residents or citizens advisory committee to this council, I strongly encourage you to revisit that schedule and schedule it during hours when most of the residents of the city would have time available to participate. And that doesn't require an answer at this point, but it's certainly a strong encouragement on my part. The CERT training, the, you know, I've wanted to sign up for that and participate in that, but I have found that, you know, the one rule in there, which is that you have to attend all meetings in the program, it has been impossible. Every time there has been a conflict with at least one of the dates when I've been unable to attend. This last one, I said, well, in November is going to be a good time. It's going to work out great with my schedule. And then, as it turns out, right before the program started, a couple days before, there was a death in the family. I had to go to a funeral and wasn't going to be able to attend the very first session. So, again, I didn't sign up. Again, I don't expect an answer tonight, but I think that might be something that there was some way to provide some flexibility in that. That would be something that might help community members participate more in that program. You're certainly right that it's a significant barrier that the CERT requires two Saturdays, two Tuesdays, two Thursdays, and attend all of them. You know, it's a very large commitment. Our committee members have advocated to the county, is there any way to do a CERT light? Is there any way to do something that would make it just two evenings? It's difficult. You're fitting in CPR, a variety of things. So to get the CERT good housekeeping seal, they feel that they're as minimum as they can. We'll continue to explore what other kinds of lower threshold training could be offered to have a citizen role in preparedness that is helpful to the preparedness or response of the people of Tacoma Park that is not CERT. Because the barrier is great. Yeah, I'm not looking for CERT light. I'm looking for CERT flexible. In other words, the same amount of training, but maybe there's an opportunity for makeup for, you know, their work. I do happen to know that that exists. That does very well exist. You can miss a class or two and make it up in the next class. They'll be as flexible as possible with you. I missed my final exam, if you will, up at the academy and went two weeks, a month later, with some instructors from Good Counsel High School and just had a blast and then got certified. So you can miss classes. Let the instructors know, though. And they'll work with you any way they can. Where is that class given again? Is that given up at the Public Service Training Academy? Typically, all parts of it are there. We have been able to negotiate twice for a down county location for everything except the final day where you really need to have the buildings and the setup that they have there to do your practical exercise. That is going to change because the Public Safety Academy is going to be under construction for the next 18 months. And they're not, at this point in time, as of a couple days ago, they're not sure where it's going to be given at this point in time for the winter session. But we'll get word out, absolutely, using our list service. That would make it a great place for disaster training. What else can we do for you? I have one other question, and that is, you know, one of my concerns with this committee for quite a while has been its role as an advisory committee. And a lot of the work that you talk about, you talk in terms of, you know, we are working on this and we are working on that. And I just wonder how much of this is a production committee and how much is an advisory committee? And how much are you, how do you make that distinction? How do you divide the work? How much is the committee actually doing and how much is the committee advising? Well, because you asked me that, I did prepare a breakdown about how we spend our time. Off the top of my head, about percentage of how we spend our time. 
I estimate that, that we spend about 10 percent of our time on um, governance and planning of our own activities, um, about another 10 percent on, on tracking, you know, where, where we are, about 40 percent of our time on working side by side with and advising. I mean, we're working together in subcommittees looking at plan, for example. Um, it's about 40 percent on advising the, the city staff um, about planning and about 40 percent on outreach. In the last um, period, we probably spent 10 percent of our time talking about what should I report to the council. Um, so it wasn't, a, uh, you know, preparing recommendations for the council was not a big part of our work in the past six months. In the first six months, we considered it a much larger part of our work because we were reviewing the plan, which we considered as, as information to bring to council. That's, does that help? So, thank you. Okay. I appreciate the uh, presentation. Of that. I appreciate your time. Joy, did you have a question? I do. Um, I, can, I can provide more on these, but I would just like to run them by you um, with the council here. Given that you have some vacancies, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, one is having the meetings at Victory Tower. Uh, when your group meets, I guess it's 8.30 a.m., mm -hmm. and Victory Tower is a place where People are very interested in emergency mm -hmm. preparedness and public safety and are, um, would love to be involved. It, it also is a beautiful facility for meetings. So um, those two things together, you know, are, are, are something that I've run by Victory Tower residents and they would love to host oh. these, uh, these meetings, this type of meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the other idea is since you're looking for people who are apartment dwellers, and we have a, a recent spate of uh, condo conversion. I know, um, I hope it's not prejudiced to say this, but a lot of times volunteers on our committees are homeowners. And so um, if, if you want to get apartment dwellers who are homeowners, then maybe the condo, the condo dwellers would be um, folks that would be interested in investing their time on the committee. And um, the other thought I had kind of bridging what um, some council members are saying about this informal network and the more formal training. Um, I would love to see a map of uh, where we have CERT people living, where we have neighborhood safety contact people living if they're still in the area. Um, but, you know, they were previously interested, so mm -hmm. where are they? How does it map out where we have Orange Hat patrol members living and really just look at our, our saturation, see what our coverage looks like. Um, I would think that at a minimum we could use that network of people to immediately subscribe um, lots of people to the alert to coma list and that that would be a very simple thing mm -hmm. that people could do just making phone calls to um, this network of people and, and you know hopefully doubling our, our numbers in short order. Um, the, the last thing I would say, this has all been terrific and I echo what other people have said. I, I think you all are, are rolling along great and if you need our guidance, um, my, my view of where advisory boards uh, need our guidance is when they start to spend money. But in general, they can take action, uh, you know, as long as it's within council policy um, for them to do activities and outreach and all of the things that you're doing. Um, but I have a sense of urgency about seeing this uh, get nailed down as soon as possible. Um, we really don't know what our uh, chances are of something happening, but the sooner we have a plan in place um, that we feel good about and that we can build on, uh, and, you know, the, the better off we will be, the better, the more defensible it will be for uh, the city government as well as our, our committee members who are investing so much of your time in this. And um, I'd really like to see it happen as soon as possible. I'm glad that the half FTE is now being devoted to it. I hope that that um, moves things along faster. And um, I would appreciate an update in three months if that was possible. Um, a lot of the things that we've raised, some of the guidelines that you've uh, talked about measuring, I'd love to hear where things are. If you want to just, you know, uh, provide that by paper, that's fine. Okay. You, um, but I, I'd love to know more as soon as you have more to tell us. 
be happy to. And it sounds like we could be helpful to you in um, helping to recruit people, as uh, Colleen suggested, for the uh, alert Tacoma system as well as we might be able to try and help recruit some members to fill your vacancies. Great. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember uh, Austin Lane, there's a map already being worked on about uh, locations. Uh, Wolfgang Merger and I are working on that. Um, so hope to have that in the next couple couple of weeks. Uh, Search are green, safety contacts are red dots. Okay. Well, we look forward to getting that. Thank you. We Can, I make, a, can I make a very brief statement? A very sure. brief, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'm probably smacked right now. But working with Stacy Baker as the chair, co-chair of this committee, and, and, and certainly Wayne Hobbs, both uh, tremendous professionals, tremendous with their organization, and have kept this committee on target, kept us moving, moving, working, working, working. And anybody who's worked with me, you know that's not easy to do. Many times I've called Stacy late at night, whatever, Mr. Hobbs, I pop into his office on my days off, and we have discussions, and it's greatly appreciated. And it's a pleasure to work with such professionals and how dedicated they are. I've been on many committees, as you know, and in many political campaigns, and I consider this a campaign, but I I've never worked with people who can keep you on such focus and such target, and it's helped this committee get where it's gotten. We've come a long ways in a year because of our co-chairs. That's sort of the dedication of the other members of the committee. Well, thank so. you, buddy. I appreciate that. Thank you. I would, I would uh, add my thanks also. Wait, no, I didn't see your smacky yet. Well, wait. <laughs> 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 I mean, that is my name isn't next to a whole lot of items in the work plan. So it's a very <laughs> active committee with a lot of people willing to do much work. So, so. Thank you. Um, we're now moving on to the final item. Since, since we're talking about future items, we're, it looks like we're going to lose Mark, who is not going to stay till the absolute bitter end. Good night, Mark. Thank you. No worries. Mark is sick. You, you will see us soon enough. Do <laughs> <laughs> you guys know where to find me? Oh, yes, we do. Multiple places. <laughs> and you can always intercept me on University Boulevard. Go between those places. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good All right. Um, we have uh, two additional items. The first one is a follow-up um, to the previous discussion we had on the um, plan to permit um, city employees to um, take loans from the deferred compensation plan. What we did with the, the paper is try to answer the questions that were posed at the last session. I don't know how successful we were, but. Uh, we outlined the provisions of the proposed loan program uh, as we as, that we are recommending to you. Uh, and if you want me to, I can go through each of these. Or um, are there questions are there from questions? the council? I mean, I think. Go ahead. Uh, um, I looked over all the materials, and it seems to me like we should go with the recommendation to. Um, allow the staff to have loans for any purpose and use the um, what's it called the AC TCH system so that the our staff don't have to process all the payroll and deductions and and manage the loans that seems to be like the, the mechanism that gives the employees the most control over what is basically their own money and has the, the least the least amount of impact on our own staff and I appreciate the restrictions that you put on it because it seems as if this would um, prevent people from sort of getting in over their heads um, yeah. with this debt. You restricted it by amount, by um, time frame, and had automatic payment provided. So that takes care of the concerns that I had. Okay. Are there any other council issues? Okay. Thank you. The final item on our agenda is a proposed closed session. Um, this is another discussion of uh, matters related to collective bargaining. Um, this is pursuant to an annotated code of Maryland State Government Article Section 10-508A9. Someone want to move the proposed closed nope. session? Who's, who said I did? Okay. And Doug Barry said second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the closed sessions, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Um, at the conclusion of the closed session, we'll adjourn for the evening. Okay.